Good morning. I'm Dr. Scott Fitzgerald with the Department of Pathobiology and Diagnostic Investigation, Michigan State University. And today I'm going to share with you some of the gross pathology of first wild mammals and then later on wild birds. Before we go into the slides, I'd like to acknowledge some of the other contributors for some of the images, including Dr. John Fisher, Davidson, and Nettles at the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study, Dr. Steve Schmidt and Tom Cooley at the Rose Lake Wildlife Disease Laboratory, part of the Department of Natural Resources in Michigan, Drs. Mandy Cupel, Willie Reed, and Mick Fulton at the Diagnostic Center for Population and Animal Health, Michigan State University, Drs. Kevin Kazakis and Sandra Schoeninger at Purdue University, Dr. Dewald Keat, Chief Veterinarian at Kruger National Park in South Africa. Dr. Elizabeth Williams at the Department of Veterinary Sciences, University of Wyoming. Dr. Mike Miller, Colorado Division of Wildlife, Fort Collins, Colorado. And with that, we're going to move on to the first slide. So we're going to start out with important viral diseases in wild mammals. The first disease that we're going to discuss is canine distemper, which is a morbillivirus affecting raccoons, canids, mustelidae, and in recent years we recognized it in large cats. Gross lesions include interstitial pneumonia, enteritis, hyperkeratosis of the paw pads, and here in this animal we can see ocular and nasal discharge characteristic of the conjunctivitis and rhinitis that associated with this disease. Here a couple of mink and you look carefully at the underside of their pads, you can see that they're raised, roughened, irregular, cracked, and reddened. Typical hard pad hyperkeratosis in chronic cases of canine distemper. In the large felids, here's a African lion, and he's yawning here as opposed to roaring. Clinical signs include uh, ticks, torticollis, recumbency, grand mal seizures, and this all accompanies the typical non-separative meningitis, encephalitis, and demyelinization. Our next disease are parvoviruses. These are characterized by feline panleukopenia, affecting all felidae, both large and small. Raccoon parvovirus, which is considered a substrain of feline panleukopenia virus, and in canine parvovirus, which affects all canids, including wild coyotes and wolves. This happens to be a cougar that died of feline panleukopenia. We can see here that the intestinal tract is diffusely reddened, and you can also appreciate the somewhat granular surface of the intestinal tract, typical in parvovirus. You get kind of a fibrinous exudate on the serosal surface of the intestines. Other gross lesions include anemia, lymphoid depletion and atrophy, necrotizing and hemorrhagic enteritis, and if we open the intestinal tract, you can appreciate that the uh, mucosa is diffusely devitalized, has this pale brown necrotic coloration. This is a bat, which is in here mostly to remind me to talk about rabies. Rabies is in the lysivirus group. All mammals are affected by this disease. Endemic strains are unique to specific species. For instance, there's an endemic strain in bats, there's another strain in the east coast in raccoons, yet another strain that's present in skunks, etc. There are key areas of the brain that should be examined depending on the species. In a large animal it's most important, excuse me, in a carnivore it's most important to, to take a look at the cerebellum. Now I'm going to mess that up again. Cerebellum is most important in herbivores, large animal herbivores. Whereas in carnivores that have rabies, it's most important to check the hippocampal region, the uh, horn of amen. And we have in a new uh, group of lysoviruses, teropid lysovirus, which is present in Australia, and they're flying foxes. This is uh, high homology with, with regular rabies, about 95 to 96 percent, but it is characterized as a distinct virus, a teropid lysovirus, serotype 7. A mass that's induced by virus is Shope fibroma in rabbits. This shows here an ear with a uh, large fibroma present. This is part of the Lepori pox virus family. 
The uh, problem is in Silvilagus or wild rabbit species. And grossly, we see these cutaneous fibropapillomas or fibromas. Another rabbit, this time the discrete fibroma present on the leg. These will spontaneously regress over time. This is a squirrel exhibiting squirrel fibroma. We can get uh, predominantly in uh, gray squirrels we see this disease. It's another member of the Lepore pox virus family. Experimentally, it's also been uh, produced in woodchucks. They characterized grossly by single to multiple cutaneous fibromas present on different portions of the body. These can become very large indeed. And in some cases, they actually become confluent. Again, has cell-mediated response, kicks in. After a period of weeks to months, these will spontaneously regress. Almost looks like a Sharpe with the severe thickening of the skin, the massive fibromas, the coalescing here. This is a white-tailed deer exhibiting deer fibromas. These cutaneous fibromas are incited by papillomavirus, only present in white-tailed deer, and they cause these pigmented and exophytic fibromas over much of the uh, body here. You see here over the hind end, over the legs, these can become very large. And like all the other papillomas, the fibromas we've seen, these will spontaneously regress over time. Wild carnivores, dogs, get canine oral papillomatosis in the papillomavirus family. Affects coyotes as well as our domestic dogs. Grossly, we see multiple papillomas present on the gums, tongue, oral mucosa, hard and soft palate going back to the oral pharynx. You see these very irregular papillomatous projections here on the tongue. The glossal surface, multifocal papillomatosis here, almost becoming confluent. Generally considered an incidental finding, however, in very advanced cases, particularly if it gets back into the uh, back of the mouth and interferes with eating, you may get an emaciated animal. Here the tongue has been removed from the body to, to better exhibit the uh, extensive covering of papillomas. This is a deer that's suffering from one of the hemorrhagic diseases of deer. These include orbiviruses in the group blue tongue as well as epizootic hemorrhagic disease. Primarily white-tailed and mule deer affected by these viruses. They're carried by the culicoides biting vector. There are a number of different syndromes we see associated with this disease. Per-acute, acute, and chronic forms exist. Gross lesions include subcutaneous edema. And you can see along the jaw region here some, some edema. We have here a, a swollen and reddened, sometimes ulcerated tongue. There can be fluid present in a number of different body cavities. Hemorrhages over a variety of, of viscera, including the heart, within the oral cavity, and along the GI tract. And sometimes in the GI tract, we get actual ulceration. Here's some severe ulcerations occurring in the oral mucosa. This is a heart from a deer, and you can see at the base of the heart there are multiple small petechial to echomonic hemorrhages present. Our next disease is malignant catarrhal fever. This is in the gamma herpes virus group. It affects all ruminants particularly those that are in association, close association with sheep, which are the asymptomatic carriers of this virus. Gross lesions include conjunctivitis, rhinitis, tracheitis, ruminitis, abomasitis, and we sometimes see some, some pale nodular masses formed on mucosal surfaces. This happens to be an opened trachea that's diffusely congested, and you can see some adherent fibrin. So there's a acute, diffuse, fibrinonecrotizing and hemorrhagic tracheitis present in this animal. 
Here's the heart and lung, showing generalized congestion of the lungs, multifocal hemorrhages present over the pulmonary as well as cardiac epicardial surfaces. This is the ablamasum that's been opened, and again, it shows a, a fairly generalized mucosal congestion and scattered petechial hemorrhages. We've had uh, major trouble with a new disease to North America, West Nile virus, which first came to the East Coast in 98 and has rapidly spread all the way across the continent now. This happens to be a severely ataxic gray squirrel. We've seen it in a number of mammal species, wild mammals. This is a flavivirus. We've seen it in chipmunks, squirrels, raccoons, skunks, and bats. Many more exotic type animals in a zoo situation are also affected. Generally, there is no gross lesion associated with this, but I think this is a very important disease for you to be up on. There will be questions on the board exam on these new emerging diseases, particularly those that have such a wide host susceptibility and, and those which affect both wild as well as domestic animals and man. This squirrel is alive. He came in. He's severely ataxic, base wide. He's very depressed. The head is held down here. He's fairly non-responsive. Here we're picking one leg up with a pen and you know that a squirrel is generally a very acrobatic, hyper-reactive animal and, and would scurry off and he's just sitting there. He's, he's tumbling backwards. Again, a base-wide stance in the rear limbs there. And here we've put the uh, pin under his chin and he's, he's just trying to maintain his balance and we can, can lift him right up backwards and flip him right over as, as if he was frozen in position there. So severe neurologic disease associated with this and generally fairly high mortality. This is a white-footed or deer mouse, and this was to remind me about the hantavirus group. There are no gross lesions of the hantavirus or, or the Sinombre virus is a specific one, but uh, it's endemic in our wild rodent population. They serve as a reservoir host without any clinical illness or any detectable gross or microscopic pathology. However, it does produce a very acute pulmonary syndrome with high mortality in human beings. It's been found in something like 38 of the 48 contiguous states. That mortality in humans is due to massive effusion into the lungs, pulmonary edema, and basically cannot breathe and, and, and die of asphyxiation. And these little guys here, they pass the uh, virus in large numbers in their feces. And when people go through and, and, and they've got a rodent problem in their houses, in their storage barns, wherever, and they're cleaning up, sweeping up feces and things, that forms aerosol and very highly infectious to human beings. That's all I wanted to cover for you on the uh, major viruses. Now we're going to move on to some important bacterial diseases which are present in our wild mammals. The first one we're going to talk about is Yersiniosis, caused by either Yersinia pseudotuberculosis or Yersinia enterocolitica. These are endemic in, in a wide variety of wildlife, predominantly small rodents and wild birds. And where we see problems with these are in our, our larger cervids, ruminants, and also sometimes in primates. This happens to be a bighorn sheep to show one of the, the typical uh, wild mammals affected by this disease. So gross lesions associated with Yersiniosis or pseudotuberculosis include diarrhea, gastroenteritis, which can affect the entire length of the GI tract from the four stomachs down through the small intestine and colon. We see uh, lymphadenitis, and microscopically there are typical crypt abscesses. This is a piece of small intestine, unopened, and through the serosal surface we see a number of pale plaques corresponding to areas of necrosis on the mucosal surface. We open that up. Here the mucosal surface has a number of, of large ulcerated areas covered with a fibrinonecrotic or dipteritic membrane. And uh, while this is not a histo course, I just wanted to show you a very characteristic histologic lesion of the small intestine. And we can see deep in the crypts these large crypt microabscesses which are associated with high numbers of neutrophils, or so they're suppurative. And also very prominent bacterial colonies are usually found with these. 
bovine tuberculosis has, has been a major problem in, in my state of Michigan for the last eight years or so, and so we're going to spend a, just a little time talking about Mycobacterium bovis, its manifestation in wildlife. Virtually all mammals are susceptible to this bacteria, especially ruminants, cervids, primates. Grossly, we see characteristic uh, involvement of the medial retropharyngeal lymph nodes and tonsils in the head, both bilaterally and unilaterally. We also see more advanced cases involving the lung, the pleura, other lymph nodes scattered throughout the body. The gross lesions vary from a, a typical abscess with a yellow purulent discharge to a, a more characteristic caseogranuloma. We believe this problem is, is in part due to high density, so we get areas where there's a lot of supplemental feeding going on, and these deer will come in and congregate for long periods of time. It's an ideal spot for lateral transmission. Typically, Mycobacterium bovis is considered to be spread by aerosol droplet infection. However, in deer, we also believe that uh, oral transmission, it's eating at a feed pile, it picks up a large partially frozen sugar beet, runs it around in its mouth, spits it out, the next deer picks it up and is able to transmit the disease that way. Here are the medial retropharyngeal lymph nodes. The nose of the deer is off to our left, the neck going down to the right, and we want to check all the, the, the head lymph nodes, the parotid, the uh, submandibular, but the medial retropharyngeal are most likely to be affected, so we cut down right behind the hyoid bone, down deep through the palate, almost down to the level of vertebral bodies. And you can see these two lymph nodes are moderately enlarged. And furthermore, they have this yellow, gritty caseogranulomas that are scattered throughout the lymph nodes. Here's another characteristic finding in which it's more of a purulent yellow exudate with a very much enlarged abscess appearing lymph node, although histologically these are caseogranulomas. In a more advanced and disseminated case, where this animal would now be considered to be a shedder and be spreading it by aerosol, you can see dissemination of, of many hundreds of small caseogranulomas. These caseogranulomas will rupture into small airways and then the infectious aerosols are produced that way. In addition to the disseminated pulmonary form, you often get plural granulomas. Here we are over the rib cage, so over the parietal pleura, as well as the visceral pleura. In very advanced, very disseminated cases, it leaves the chest cavity and actually gets into the abdominal cavity. We can see dissemination over the, the lungs and pleura, disseminated nodules present in the liver, in the mesentery, and the serosal surface of the intestine as well. Other countries besides the United States have problems with tuberculosis becoming endemic in their wildlife. The problem in New Zealand are these brush-tailed possums. They're considerably more attractive than our North American possum, but uh, they do have the problem of being very susceptible to developing disseminated tuberculosis. It disseminates out to the uh, subcutaneous lymph nodes which then rupture and drain through the skin to the outside, releasing thousands of the infectious organisms. Here's a uh, dead brush-tailed possum on the back, and we're, we're looking down at the underside and these, these uh, draining tracks that come out. These possums will be laying in the field with the draining tracks, and it'll attract cattle to come up to them, and, and they'll, they'll lick and sniff at them, and therefore infect over into the uh, domesticated cattle, posing a more severe threat to human foods, food safety. This is the lungs from an infected brush-tailed possum. You can see the, the advanced multifocal disseminated granulomatous pneumonia associated with bovine tuberculosis. They also have a problem with endemic tuberculosis in the wildlife in South Africa, notably Kruger National Park and the African buffalo is, is, is affected. This happens to be a, a, a Cape buffalo with the uh, chest cavity opened, and you can see advanced pulmonary lesions present in the lungs here. A little closer, we can appreciate these multifocal to disseminated caseogranulomas. 
Typical for tuberculosis, however, if you do not do the cultures or at least an acid fast stain, it could be any number of other infectious bacterial organisms. Other wildlife in, in Kruger are affected. This is a kudu. Sometimes the abscessed lymph nodes will drain into the subcutaneous tissues, creating large pockets. And then when the kudu are running through the uh, underbrush here, they'll, they'll uh, pop those uh, subcutaneous abscesses open or rip them on a thorn. And again, you'll get large amounts of the highly infectious drainage, purulent material that'll go into the uh, foliage here and, and spread the disease. Here's one of these subcutaneous abscesses that's been opened up on a kudu, and you can see that it's a very thick, viscid caseogranulomatous to purulent exudate there. And unfortunately, many, many carnivores that can feed either on living animals that are weakened from the tuberculosis or, or feed on the carcasses, their dead remains. And in the United States, the problem is mostly in hunter-killed animals. And the gut piles are taken out and left there in, in the wild. And the carnivores become secondarily infected as, as spillover hosts. They don't generally serve as reservoirs, nor, nor are they uh, communicating the disease to others. But you can see that this African lion is very severely emaciated. And if you look at the, that lion's heart, see massive pericardial, epicardial, granulomatous inflammation. That was undoubtedly the cause of this animal's death. We're going to switch to a different bacterial disease now, pastorellosis, caused by Pastorella multocida. This disease is, is present in virtually all animals or all mammals are susceptible. However, we see it most commonly in deer, bison, bighorn sheep, and rabbits. It became complicated in the uh, ruminants by a number of underlying viruses that predispose to secondary pastorella. These would include bovine respiratory syncytial virus, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, and bovine viral diarrhea viruses. The typical gross uh, characterization is a bronchopneumonia often associated with a pleuritis, and particularly in some of the smaller animals, including rabbits, we get widespread abscessation. So these are our lungs here, exhibiting a typical anterior ventral bronchopneumonia. You can see these are firm, they fail to collapse, they're very mottled, there is some fibrin present on the surface. We get a little closer in here, and you can see on cut section there is some granulomatous or, or microabscessation present in the lungs, as well as consolidation. A very severe fibrinoseparative covering on the pleura of these lungs. And a cut section, you begin to appreciate the lesion a little better. It has a typical patchy checkerboard pattern reminiscent of, of your classic bronchopneumonia. Some of these are very hemorrhagic, others are more normal pink color, others are very tan and discolored and, and consolidated with inflammatory infiltrates. And this is, this is a classic bacterial bronchopneumonia, pastorella being one of the most common causes of that. Abscesses, I already mentioned, do occur. Due to a variety of reasons, this happens to be a skin subcutaneous tissue opened up from a rabbit, and it's draining a, a fair amount of purulent material. You can see this uh, in association with streptococcal species, staphylococcal species, pseudomonas, arcanobacteria, pyogenes, as well as pastorella. Virtually all species of mammals are susceptible to uh, bacterial abscessation. Grossly, you get a, a discrete walled off and fluctuant mass. When you, you palpate it, you can kind of pick up the fact that it has a fluid core by, by blotting it. And then when you open it up, you get a, a, anywhere from a, a white to yellow to green purulent exudate present in the center of this walled off mass. Here's a rabbit that's been skinned out with multiple small subcutaneous abscesses surrounded by some granulation tissue. We do see abscesses in the brain, particularly in my experience. We see these in cervids. It may have something to do with the fact that they have antlers and 
The males particularly will, will bang around with one another and it seems to be a source of trauma and bacterial entrance into the brain. This is a deer that was seen out in the field from some distance and, and it was having problems. It was ataxic, it was falling down, it didn't seem wary. The next morning it was found dead and so the uh, landowner went out and brought the carcass in. And you can see here multiple hemorrhagic foci scattered throughout the brain parenchyma. Some of these are quite large and begin to be associated with some cavitation or some necrosis of the brain parenchyma. This turned out uh, histologically to be a fairly characteristic TEME, a thromboembolic meningoencephalitis, where the uh, necrosis, the hemorrhage, the inflammation was centered on vessels. Bacterial organisms were present in the vessels. However, this was not due to Haemophilus somnus, so that it should be in your differential. In this case, it was due to a uh, streptococcal species. One other word on, on abscesses in the brain of, of deer. I've seen very commonly where they have retrobulbar abscesses and the pus will actually travel up along the optic nerve and reach the brain pan that way and you get a, 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 a uh, either a purulent meningitis or a brain abscess and a, very unusual in my experience in many domestic animals to see that extension from the eye up along the optic nerve but I have seen it a number of times in white-tailed deer. This young deer is suffering from dermatophilosis. Dermatophilosis most typically in, involves the, the head and the uh, dorsal aspects. Here we've got the ears, top of the muzzle. Causes a pustular dermatitis with crusts and often associated with alopecia. Dermatophilus congolensis. And uh, it can be quite severe in, in white-tailed deer, particularly young or, or in uh, run-down deer that may be secondarily immuno depressed or suppressed due to other concurrent disease conditions or nutritional, poor nutrition. This is a beaver. Beavers and other aquatic type of rodents are particularly susceptible to tularemia. Tularemia is caused by the bacterial organism Francisella tularensis. We see this beavers and muskrats as well as rabbits, other small rodents causes an acute septicemia, which is indistinguishable from many others. Pneumonia, see multifocal necrotizing hepatitis, splenitis, lymphadenitis, and occasionally we see uh, multifocal granulomas as well. Here's the lung. This lung is severely mottled, dark red to pale pink to, to almost tan areas of consolidation classic checkerboard bronchopneumonia pattern. This is a cross-section through the spleen, exhibiting areas of either necrosis or, or it can, in a more chronic case, be granulomas form in the red pulp of the spleen. Liver from an affected animal showing uh, scattered multifocal necrosis, little pinpoint white foci scattered throughout all lobes, diffusely, randomly throughout the parenchyma due to embolic shower of the organism in a septicemic form. And here we're looking at mesentery and a mesenteric lymph node on cut section. Not only is this mesenteric lymph node quite enlarged, but it also has a, a white infiltrate, so a granulomatous lymphadenitis associated with tularemia. Tizzer's disease is our next bacterial disease. This is caused by Clostridium piliforme. We see it again in, in, in our smaller wildlife, muskrats, rabbits, other small mammals. This is the characteristic appearance in a young animal with a random multifocal necrotizing hepatitis, a very small pinpoint, non-raised. Sometimes uh, if you get very close, you can even press that they're somewhat depressed lesions due to the fact that it's necrosis and not so much inflammatory infiltrate. Other lesions associated with Tizzer's disease. We see hemorrhages throughout a number of, of organs, uh, ulceration and necrosis present in the cecum, so an ulcerative and necrotizing tiflitis or enteritis. And, but the, the, probably the most characteristic lesion we look for is this multifocal necrotizing hepatitis.
a little closer look at this liver. Very fine, small foci, almost confluent in some area of, of necrotic parenchyma here. This is the uh, outer serosal surface of the intestine, and you can see these pale plaque-like lesions that we're seeing through the serosa, but they're actually present on the mucosal surface, and that's multifocal necrotizing enteritis. And here this intestine has been opened up, and you can see that it is a hemorrhagic in some cases, in other cases, it's, it's more ulcerative and necrotizing. Ticks. These are a couple of ticks to remind me to say a few words about Lyme disease. Lyme disease is not a major problem in wildlife. However, they do act as the primary reservoir hosts for it. Borrelia burgdorferi is the bacterial spirochete agent. It causes absolutely no clinical disease in any wildlife that I'm aware of. However, in, in human beings, uh, they get a severe rash at the site of where the tick fed on them. And in chronic cases, it can develop into a severe arthritis or even neurologic disease. Ixodes scapularis is the major tick vector that we see. And this tick vector spends much of its time living on deer mice, wood rats, or Norway rats. Those rats are the uh, primary endemic host for, for Lyme disease. People call these deer ticks, and they do spend part of their life feeding on, tick, on deer as well. However, the deer are not a host for Borrelia burgdorferi. With that, we're going to finish up with the bacterial diseases and move into parasites. Parasites are a very large problem in wildlife. These animals are, are feeding on one another. They're feeding off shared rangeland. There's no one giving them a regular worming schedule or checking their, their fecals for parasite loads. They're, they're, they're not getting any store-bought, high-quality feed. So uh, therefore, the parasites become a very real, important problem in most wildlife. The first one I'd like to talk about is sarcoptic mange, external parasite of the skin. We see this uh, caused by sarcoptis scabii and infecting a, a variety of canids, fox, coyote, wolves, number of wild felids, and then in rodents, wild rodents, particularly squirrels, it's a fairly major problem. Other hosts include primates, cervids, etc. Grossly, what do we see? We see uh, areas of alopecia associated with a hyperkeratotic, crusted, and, and seborrheic skin. And so you can see on this squirrel here, there's, there's patches where, where there's very little hair and, and the skin is kind of thick and lichenified. Uh, darkly pigmented. Here's a coyote. It has some, some major areas of alopecia over the trunk and the, the limbs. These tend to be very pruritic lesions. Fox, this red fox, and for some reason it affects red fox preferentially over gray fox. You can see he's almost 100 percent alopecic over his entire body except for his tail. You can see that the uh, skin is thrown up into to thickened crusts and, and, and hyperkeratotic and cracked, like kenified skin. We get a little closer here. We can see this is now the uh, dorsal surface of his skin, not his paw pad, but the, uh, the dorsal surface of his paw. And you can see, again, this, this alopecia and this, this thickening of the skin. And if we look very closely at the head, thick cracks and crusts and there's an exudation that the skin tends to be wet with all the sebum and, and these actually can result in, in death to the animal and in severe uh, immunosuppression when you get such a large portion of the external skin being affected by this type of disease. One final slide on, on sarcoptic mange. And again, this is not a histo course, but, but sometimes it's instructive to, to look at the histologic features and you can see multiple Typical arthropod parasites in here, chitinous exoskeleton, striated muscle, jointed appendages, but these, these are very similar to what we see in our domestic uh, dogs with its out in the outer hyperkeratotic cornified layer. It does not get down deep into the living epidermis itself. 
Next disease, ear mites due to uh, Seropthes cuniculi, the two main species affected being deer and rabbits. Grossly, the ears will droop on these animals due to heavy accumulation of, of wax and just a generalized otitis externa. And so this, this here is, is a white-tailed deer ear, and you can see the, the heavy wax and crusty buildup and the fact that this ear is, is, is heavy and drooping on there. And we cannot obviously see the ear mites grossly, but, but we can certainly appreciate the secondary effects. In really severe cases, we may get uh, head tilt, otitis media causing uh, circling and other disease. Ticks are certainly a problem in heavy loads such as in this young deer. A heavy tick burden here causing periocular swelling, inflammation, some loss of hair, some alopecia. In heavy tick loads we can actually get uh, even anemia, emaciation of the animal, and focal dermatitis where they're feeding. Different species of ticks that we see commonly include amblyoma species, ixodes, and dermacenter species. All mammals are affected, but uh, I particularly see this as a common problem in, in young deer fawns. Another external parasite that we run into, myiasis or warbles. This is present here in this case. This is the head of a rabbit. You can see this rabbit's little uh, cleft lip and nose here. And you can see that this is forming a large subcutaneous area that has several of the warbles within it. The larval form of these uh, cuterebra is the species of uh, flying insect. They lay their eggs around the entrance holes to uh, rabbits and rodents and some sometimes small mammals becoming in contact because they're sniffing around these holes looking for a free meal. They burrow into the skin. They go through different instar larval instar stages, form these large subcutaneous cysts, often with a small communicating pore to the outside and then eventually it'll set up a fair amount of tissue necrosis. The other problem that we get is, is aberrant migration through the tissues. It, it often migrates through the chest cavity and you can have these come out of very strange aberrant sites uh, in, the, in the chest, in the trachea. We've seen them in the eye and, and one of the more common aberrant sites, probably because it results in death when it's associated with this site, is present here in the brain. Deer have their own particular type of nasal bot. Cephanomyia species, there's about four major species in white-tailed deer, Cephanomyia gelsoni, Phobiophore, Pratii, and Trompi. These affect a number of the cervids, not just white-tailed deer. And grossly, we see the presence of these, these yellow pseudo-segmented larvae present uh, most typically in the retropharyngeal pouches in the back of the throat, sometimes very large masses of these. This one happens to be exiting from the, the neri, the nose here. And here's a, a more classic example where we've done a hemisection of this deer's head and you can see in the, the oropharyngeal area, this retropharyngeal pouch is just filled with many dozens of these. Seems to be completely an incidental finding. These animals do not have trouble eating or apprehending food. They don't have any trouble swallowing. They get along very happily without, with these uh, cephanomyia present in them. A little closer, showing that there can be large numbers of these in these small retropharyngeal pouches. They do seem to cause a little localized irritation, some, some hemorrhage and, and some superficial mucosal necrosis, but, but nothing of any clinical significance. And another section here, you can see we've, we've cut through the uh, proximal trachea, and this is the pharynx area, and you can see several of the larvae adjacent to it. Giant liver fluke, Fasciuloides magna. These are, are present in white-tailed deer and elk, which serve as their definitive hosts and don't cause a whole lot of, of clinical problem in these. Hosts, however, in areas that have a large deer or elk population and they're interacting with, with other cervids and ruminants, particularly domestic cattle, we, we can see some rather severe disease in these aberrant hosts. Grossly, these are found in the liver. 
They form hepatic cysts that contain one or more flukes. Around the uh, cyst is, is some fibrosis, which is due to their migration before they settle into a spot, and the black fluke pigment, which consists of the uh, blood they fed upon and then regurgitated out of their system. So these are very large, leaf-like, dorsoventrally flattened flukes here. These flukes are, are true hermaphrodites, however, you have to have at least two in there. They will not uh, auto-reproduce. They do need to have uh, multiple flukes in a cyst in order to produce their eggs. Very large. You can see this is three or four centimeters in length. See a different type of fluke in the lung. This is paragonomyosis, due to paragonomus calcutti. These are present uh, in muskrat, bobcat, other wild canids. We see them as, as multiple pale fluid-filled cysts scattered throughout the parenchyma of the lung, all lo lung lobules affected. On opening these cysts, there are generally multiple larvae present within each of these, excuse me, multiple flukes present in each cyst. Again, it takes at least two in order to have a patent infection and have reproduction going on. And this uh, happens to be one of these cystic cavities. I opened them up and there were, there were five of them in there that were, uh, these are much smaller on the order of about a half centimeter in diameter in the giant liver fluke. This is a different class of, of parasite. They're moving into cestodes now, and this is Echinococcus. Echinococcus granulosus is the first one we're going to cover. The definitive host for these is wolf or, or coyote, the large carnivore host. The intermediate host is moose or deer. Grossly, in the intermediate host, we see multiple fluid-filled unilocular cysts either in the lung or the liver. And so this is a section, a, a cross-section of liver here. And you can see these pale, kind of white, parasitic uh, cavities that are walled off with a little fibrosis. I don't know if you can make out any of the, the small organisms in here, the hydatid sand. This happens to be a fixed section of uh, lung that was affected, and, and excuse me, this is still liver, and this liver has been almost uh, reduced to Swiss cheese here because of the very large multiple cystic cavities, and it, you see a little bit better the uh, fibrotic tissue that tends to wall them off, and then there's a parasitophorous membrane off which bud many of these uh, individual organisms. Just a histologic uh, example here to show this, this capsule lining the cyst and these very small protoscolices, the inverted scolices that represent the larval or intermediate form of the tapeworm. The definitive host, of course, has the, uh, a more normal appearing uh, segmented tapeworm present in its GI tract. This is another uh, major Cesto disease, echinococcosis, alveolar hydatid disease, due to echinococcus multilocularis. This particular slide compares in a normal adult echinococcus, excuse me, uh, adult echinococcus multilocularis, which are the, the adults in this stage, these little tiny guys that are around one or two millimeters in length, with a single adult tapeworm of tinea spe species that we're more used to seeing. So these are very small, they're very easy to overlook in the feces of an animal, and, and that's one of the great dangers with this zoonotic disease is that you can't hardly seed these. They're very resistant to drying, to desiccation, to, to, to attempts to destroy them, and so they can uh, contaminate an environment for a very long period of time. This is a close-up of one of those adult multilocularis. It only has three or four body segments. One segment has the uh, proglottid on it for attachment, and it has one, two, at most three segments, the, the last of which has the uh, developing ova, eggs in there, and then when these break off one at a time, they're released, and they shed into the environment hundreds and thousands of the infectious eggs. The problem with these is they do create uh, large multilocular uh, 
cysts, one cyst budding off another. These cysts almost act as a, as a uh, neoplasm in that they, they get encysted in here and it happens to be in a rodent liver and they keep pinching off and destroying more and more of the parenchyma, pressure atrophy and to the point where, where it almost makes that organ dysfunctional. This process also goes on in humans, has a uh, aberrant host and it, it is a very grave problem and, and requires surgery and uh, not amenable very well to most of our typical anti-parasiticides. Other tapeworms of interest, this is uh, cystocercosis or rabbit blisters. This open rabbit carcass contains a number of the uh, larval cystic forms. They look like little, small, white, fluid-filled blisters coming off the serosa of the intestine, off the mesentery, off the liver. Tania pisiformis is the species. Definitive host, again, it's a, a carnivore canid. Intermediate host, we see them primarily in rabbits, wild rabbits and, and wild rodents. Grossly, we, we get these larval cystic circus cysts present in, in the different spots I mentioned, the liver, the serosa of the abdominal viscera, and then in the uh, definitive host in the canid present as an adult form in the intestines. So another open rabbit with numerous fluid-filled cysts present on the serosal surface. This one it stands out very nicely. We've taken the intestine and we've spread it out with a pleasing background. And so you can see these little, little blisters or bladder worms. And you can see the little protoscolacy here. On one end is this little white dot. And they adhere to the uh, serosal surface. In advanced cases, this happens to be a squirrel. Much of the liver parenchyma has been damaged. Uh, while most of the time we find them external on the serosal or, or visceral surfaces, they can go into the parenchyma of some of these organs, particularly the liver. And in this case, we begin to get significant cavitation and, and pressure atrophy of, of the liver itself. This is cystocercosis thin-necked bladder worm, which is the one we see in white-tailed deer. Tania hydatogena. The definitive host, again, a, a wild canid of some type, a, a coyote, a wolf. Intermediate host, in this case, tends to be the large cervids, white-tailed deer, black-tailed deer, mule deer, elk. Grossly, these are very similar to the uh, blisters or bladder worms that we saw present on this serosa in the uh, rabbit, but here's one adhering to the serosal surface, uh, visceral surface of the liver. We're going to switch to a little different type of worm now. We're going to look at meningeal worm present in the brain. Paralophostrongulus tenuis, Paralophostrongulus andersoni, or Otocolia are the three species that are, are common endemic in white-tailed deer throughout North America. And they are completely incidental, subclinical, non-problematic in these normal hosts. However, they do cause disease in aberrant hosts, including moose, elk, other deer species, uh, black-tailed deer, mule deer, fallow deer, etc. Also in some of our domestic ruminants, including llamas and sheep. Grossly, the worms tend to be very thin, coiled, white worms present in the subdural space. They can also form in their abnormal hosts, tracts and cavities, where they pass through the brain or the spinal cord parenchyma. So this is a white-tailed deer, his calvarium, and we're pulling the the brain back, and I don't know if you can make out the, the little worm along here, but we have some, some better pictures coming up. Here, here's the top of the calvarium. It's been taken off. And you see the fine, thin, thread-like. You really have to look hard to see these, but in surveys we've done in Michigan and other parts of the Midwest, we'll have uh, up to 20, 30, 40 percent of the deer will be carrying these worms. So obviously, if you have a high wild deer population, you have people re rearing white-tailed deers in captivity. They come into close proximity, they come into fields and feed where cattle, llamas, other domestic animals are feeding. You have good potential for this disease. As white-tailed deer become ever greater in numbers and, and expanding their range, they're also getting into areas where they interfere with other wildlife, with moose and, and animals that, that cannot take the uh, brain worm without severe clinical disease.
it results in, a, in a kind of a generalized uh, emaciation. These animals are often ataxic. They may have uh, ear droop, head tilts, a variety of neurologic disease, and, and can be very high mortality associated with this. Here's a uh, section of the brain of one of these aberrant hosts, and we've actually teased one of these very long, thin parallophostrongulus out of the brain, and you can see there are some areas of gray in the brain representing either old hemorrhage or even actual malacia of the parenchyma of the brain. Raccoons, if we're talking raccoons and its parasites, we're talking raccoon roundworm, Bayless ascaris, Procyonis. A uh, close cousin of this is Bayless ascaris columnaris, which is a uh, definitive host is skunks, striped skunks. And either the raccoon or the skunk serve as a definitive host for their respective species, and they generally don't cause any problem in their, their host. They stay in the intestinal tract and everything is fine. However, they go aberrantly into many, many mammals and birds. The list goes on. 50, 60, 75 different species have been reported affected, including man. These aberrant hosts are, are, are a big problem. Uh, because uh, they, they have a predisposition in the aberrant host to either go to the brain or the eye, which results in severe clinical disease. Here's a raccoon, the normal host, his intestinal tract, and they're just like any other large, robust, ascarid nematode parasite you might see, and it's not a problem. But remember, raccoons live in close proximity to man, going into the garbage, into our dumps, and wherever they can for a free handout. A lot of people uh, like to rear these uh, as, as pseudo pets. A lot of people are involved in, in wildlife rehabilitation, and so these will shed the organ infectious eggs in very large numbers, and these also are extremely difficult to uh, desiccation. They'll stay in the environment for many, many months after they've been put there, and, and they can cause problem if accidentally ingested. This is the normal raccoon latrine here in a crook of a stump of a tree here between the uh, two major roots and there's a pile of raccoon scat for those of you who don't get out in the woods much and haven't seen this type of thing. And here are the eggs. Microscopically there can be literally tens or hundreds of thousands in a teaspoon of soil where the raccoons have been going on a regular basis and so it's a very potentially highly infectious organism because of the high numbers that are shed. Here's a squirrel. That was infected with the worm. I barely went to this head. You can see again the wide, base wide stance, the head being thrown back, opistotinus, torticollis, advanced CNS disease here. Woodchuck, this is not a dead woodchuck, this is a live woodchuck, but it's in lateral recumbency. It's severely depressed, showing some seizure activity, and, and, and not a very happy woodchuck. And our final slide here is a human being's brain, which unfortunately was subjected to the uh, migration of one of these aberrant parasites, and you can see there's some significant parenchymal necrosis here. We're discussing the uh, pathology of wildlife, wild mammals, working on the parasitic diseases, and our next disease that we're interested in is heartworm or dirofilariasis, caused by the parasite dirofilaria imitis. Canids in general are affected, and the wild canids uh, that we see it in are coyotes, foxes, wolves, and bear. Of course, this is a mosquito transmitted disease, and so it's, it pretty much covers all of North America, starting out on the, the two coasts and, and, and throughout the Midwest, and that's pretty much everywhere. Grossly, we see uh, large adult worms present in the right side of the heart, the right ventricle, and pulmonary artery and producing lesions including endarteritis, cardiomegaly, sometimes we see some, some pathology in the lungs. This here happens to be a uh, coyote that we opened up and often the infection in wildlife is not as severe for whatever reason it does not as, seem to be as permissive a host as our domestic dog so it's just a single large dirofilaria adult present in the right atrium of the ventricle of this heart. However, sometimes it can be a uh, significant disease. You can see there are a dozen or more hearts coiled, worms coiled up in the right side of the heart of this coyote, and it can result in clinical disease and even death. This is the bear filarid worm, Dirofilaria ursi, present in black bears and transmitted by black flies. 
We find these in the subcutaneous tissues, the adults. This is generally considered a asymptomatic subclinical problem. This happens to be a, a skin, subcutaneous tissue of a bear that was hunted and scun out, and you can see the, the white coiled up uh, nematode parasite present here, Ceteria. Next worm of interest is the North American guinea worm. This is found in, in subcutaneous tissues of a variety of wild mammals. We see it uh, raccoons, mink, skunk, foxes, weasels, possums, otters. A lot of these are near the water for some reason, seems to be a suitable habitat. The particular agent is Dracunculus insignis. And this worm will. Uh, go through a copepod intermediate host, which explains why it's, it tends to be around the water. Grossly, we see a subcutaneous nodule or swelling. And if we open that up, or sometimes the surface becomes ulcerated with a, with a small uh, <coughs> hole in it, you can see the organism. So these are limbs from a variety of, of uh, it's a raccoon limb here. And you can see rolled up inside the uh, subcutaneous tissue. It's a very long worm, but it forms rather small nodules because it tends to be very tightly wound up in there. This parasite, the stomach worm, there's a couple different species actually. Physiloptera species are, are relatively common, as are Nathostoma species. This happens to be in opossums. Possums get a, a, a lot of this, but we also see it in raccoons. That's because the cockroach is the uh, intermediate host. And cockroaches to possums are like candy to you and me. This is their favorite food, and they very greedily eat these animals up. And unfortunately, they develop infections with uh, Physiloptera. This was a, rac a uh, possum that I had on an experimental study. It became an appetent and, and eventually died. And when I opened it up, I found it died because of a ruptured uh, stomach here. In the anterior abdomen, you can see some blood and some other debris in there. This animal had been originally wild caught and had been treated with a rather intensive course of antihelmintics two or three times to try and get them as clean and free of parasites as we could. A little closer picture, and we can see these very stout, large, pale worms and all the, the bloody debris from the abdomen from the uh, gastric rupture. And here's the uh, stomach opened up from another animal. This one didn't rupture, but you can see these are very stout, very large five to ten centimeters long and, and, and these things are generally considered subclinical but if you get a high enough number of them they can either cause a spontaneous rupture or they can act as a uh, form of plug and, and interfere with the uh, flow of food out of the stomach. Another large worm we see in uh, wildlife is the giant kidney worm Dioctophema renale. This is seen in mink Mustelidae and canids. It goes through a uh, oligochaete, which is a uh, aquatic worm. And so again, this is going to be around uh, watery environments, swamps, ponds, streams. The right kidney, for some reason, is preferentially infected. About 75 to 80 percent of your cases will be in the right kidney. These, kid these worms will be present uh, coiled up within the pelvis of the kidney. And because they are, again, a very large worm, this, this large uh, female here is probably 30 to 40 centimeters in length. The, the male is somewhat smaller. He's 10 or 15. But this is a very large worm. It'll take up a lot of space. It can cause obstructive lesions such as hydronephrosis. And it also can be irritating, uh, cause debris to accumulate. And you can get secondary renal calculi in the pelvis associated with this disease. Here's a much smaller parasite. This is a protozoan parasite, sarcocystosis. Happens to be uh, in insisted in intramuscular uh, regions of the uh, host. This is a rabbit. We see it in rabbits and rodents. We also see uh, a different species in, in cervids. These serve as the intermediate host in which it's insisted in the muscle tissue. These small, pale, almost rice grain-like appearing, although smaller than a rice grain, uh, parasite. They're actually insisted within a single myofiber cell and it becomes enlarged and the cyst contains large numbers of uh, zoites which when this is ingested by a carnivore host which is the uh, definitive host and they're released into the uh, GI tract. 
prominent intramuscular sarcocysts, uh, can be very fine in, in, in certain species, particularly in the cervid uh, host. The large cervid seems to get very small. Here's a elk that died of another reason. This had a uh, degenerative myelopathy with a copper deficiency, but uh, we open this elk up, and I don't know if you can appreciate it, low magnification, very white fine pinpoint almost foci disseminated through this heart we get a little bit closer to it and you can see them now very small parasites indeed these are generally considered completely incidental if you look at them microscopically there, there generally is no inflammatory reaction very occasionally a, an older cyst will rupture and you get a, a mild granulominous response around it but uh, generally considered an incidental finding in in the intermediate hosts Another small protozoal parasite is Besnoidiosis, caused by Besnoidia darlingi in possums and Bes Besnoidia gelsoni in rodents. These are the intermediate hosts. So again, this is the host that has the encysted form present in a wide variety of, of different tissues. They actually parasitize fibroblasts. So fibroblasts are present in virtually any tissue in the body. Here we've got the pluck removed from a possum and you can see widely disseminated small white foci. These are round as opposed to the more linear sarcocystis, but they can be fairly difficult to differentiate and I have seen possums in the wild that'll have uh, two different sarcocysts and bisnoidia all at the same time, so, so they can be a little different, harder to differentiate, but they're much wider tissue distribution. You can see them present here in the myocardium of the heart. We see them throughout the pulmonary pleura. We can see them very commonly in the skeletal muscle, the tongue a wide variety of, of organs and viscera, liver, GI tract, etc. <laughs> this happens to be skeletal muscle. If you read past the highlights, you can see the very small on the level of one to two millimeter round bisnoidia cysts disseminated throughout here. Again, a subclinical infection causes no problem. Uh, occasionally older parasites that rupture will cause very mild inflammation, but uh, even a heavy parasitism is not usually a clinical problem in these beasts. Now here's an interesting manifestation in a possum where it's very severely infiltrating through the uh, uterus here. This happens to be open mucosal surface or endometrial surface of the uterus and you can see confluent sarcocystosis here. This could result in, in a subclinical problem with reproductive failure but of no real disease state to the uh, host animal. And microscopically, just so you know what we're talking about, here happens to be skeletal muscle, multiple encysted, no inflammatory reaction. You can uh, pop these cysts open and they contain literally thousands of zoite stages, which are, make a very nice cytoprep, but uh, completely incidental finding. We'll move on now out of the parasites and into the, some of the miscellaneous disease conditions, which can be quite interesting. The first disease condition that we're going to talk about is chronic wasting disease. This is uh, in the news. It's spread very rapidly out of the uh, far west, out of Colorado and, and some of those areas. And now it's showing up in the Midwest, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois. So, so it, it made a very large jump and got a lot of people concerned. This is one of those uh, prion diseases, uh, almost a virus but not quite. Tend to be very chronic in their progression tend to be no antemortem testing that you can do for it. We know about mad cow disease in, in Europe in cattle, which be, beget a, uh, an acute Crouchfeld-Jacob syndrome in human beings, and so there's concern, although nothing proven, that this could become a human health hazard here in the North America, and so people are very concerned about it. To our knowledge, the only three cervid species that have ever been infected, affected by the chronic wasting disease are white-tailed deer, mule deer, an elk. Now I get every day I get fallow deer and, and, and little Japanese sika deer and, and, and moose and reindeer and everything else brought into the lab and they ask for chronic wasting disease testing but as far as we know these are the only three species that have ever been infected with this disease. Grossly it's characterized by emaciation, some generalized depression and, and neurologic as in this case here this is a drooling elk with his uh, tongue hanging out and uh, some, some saliva coming off there. You can see uh, ataxia, which is, I don't think it's really truly neurologic. I think it's more just an extreme emaciation, rundown condition. I think you can appreciate the very prominent bones, the scapular bones, the rib bones, the hooks and pins, everything kind of sticks out. The hair coat on this elk is not particularly pleasing here, so you can tell he's a very 
run down, emaciated looking animal here. Weakness, tremors, uh, seems to be pretty much 100% fatal when it runs its course, but the course can be very prolonged, many months. Here's a, a female mule deer that's, that's very much run down, emaciated. You've got the uh, weakness with the base wide stance. The head's being held down. Again, big, big uh, draw of drool going on here. So, so it's a fairly typical picture for an advanced case. Obviously, uh, this is much more advanced than the early cases that you'd get for routine diagnostic surveillance. Here's an emaciated uh, elk, female elk without any horns. And again, the prominence of the ribs. White-tailed deer, fairly young deer, still has some white spots, but again, in, in a very poor body condition with the prominent ribs, the prominent hook and pin bones here. Many other diseases can cause emaciation, uh, tuberculosis in an advanced stage, uh, heavy parasitism, septicemias, a, a wide variety of diseases, but, but when you see this in the classic three uh, potential species and you're in an area where the, the disease is known, then, then this is something to be aware of. This is certainly something for those of you taking boards to be aware of. It's a high priority item, a lot of things in the, in the uh, recent press on this and the journals, and so you should be well aware of this disease. Here's a uh, Another emaciated deerling here. Here's one that's been scun out, skinned out carcass, and, and he, he can, without the, the height on there, you can appreciate the prominence of the, the scapular, the ribs. Just not much subcutaneous body fat at all on this animal. So that's what I have on uh, chronic wasting disease. Next. Uh, Miscellaneous disease I want to cover is capture myopathy or nutritional myopathy. These myopathies are going to show up as gross lesions in the skeletal muscle. They're going to be characterized by, by pallor and degeneration here. This is a, a large leg muscle cut through, and you can see these patchy, white, chalky, uh, discolored areas here. Character this is related to uh, levels of vitamin E and selenium, which serve as antioxidants but it's also related to stressors that, that cause uh, damage to the muscle, and, and stress is pretty common in these wildlife when we attempt to uh, chase them and capture them. So these are what they call capture myopathy. And you certainly have regions of the country, large regions, including most of the Midwest, where selenium deficiency is just, just part and parcel of the way the soil and the... Uh, the uh, plant products are in that area, and so that's a predisposing factor. Here's clostridial myositis. This is a little different uh, etiology here. Again, it shows up in the skeletal muscle, but we see areas of, of hemorrhage and kind of pale, dry discoloration, degeneration of the muscle. This is due to uh, clostridium chauvii. These spores are, are present normally in the muscle. They're ingested and they go out into the muscle and just lay in wait for some type of muscle damage for an anaerobic condition for them to sporulate and uh, rapidly divide and produce their toxins. Or you can have external contamination through a wound, and in this case that would be associated with Clostridium septicum. I've seen this fairly commonly in deer, but you can see it in, in a wide variety of, of uh, animals. These are uh, often a sequela to, to either restraint or to darting. You know, sometimes these darts are, are taken, uh, the shot is too close, or the charge is too great for the, the size and the distance, and so these darts can penetrate in an inch or two into the muscle and create a lot of damage, and in the, within a few hours to days, these animals will die of this type of hemorrhagic and necrotizing myositis associated with large numbers of clostridia. Focal muscle hemorrhage, edema, gas, dry necrosis are all part and parcel of the syndrome. Close up showing some of these very dry, devitalized, almost look like they have some gas pockets present in this, this dying muscle here. It's a reindeer that was presented. They were suspicious it might have TB. It was a skin reactor, and so we get a lot of these as we, we test more and more cervids in the country for tuberculosis. And I found an interesting firm nodular mass along the ventral midline of the neck here. And I said maybe this is a, an enlarged lymph node or granuloma, an abscess, whatever. So we uh, took this in to take a look at it. And it turned out to be a dermoid cyst. Dermoid cysts are, are not really neoplasms. They're more uh, developmental anomalies. 
usually along the midline. Uh, you think of them more typically dorsally, but you also have them along the ventral midline, and in, in which the the uh, skin becomes invaginated in and follow, forms a small pocket, and that pocket expands and grows and becomes more and more firm over time because the hair and the sebum and the keratinized debris are all accumulating. It's got no way to to, to, to slough it off to the outside the way you have the normal outside of the skin and so these masses can become quite large over time if these animals reach adulthood. Generally considered a uh, incidental finding but I've seen this a number of times not just in this reindeer now but in a number of white-tailed deer. It seems like deer are predisposed to this compared to some other animals but any animal which has uh, haired skin which means all mammals would be su subject to developing such a developmental condition and something you should be aware of. If you look at this on cross-section, it's, it's got a beautiful uh, hair-filled center. There'll be some fluid in here from the sebum and the other uh, adnexal structures in the skin that are secreting in there. And if you do a histologic exa examination, it looks just like skin. I mean, it's got everything. It's got an epidermis and, a, and a adnexal structures, including uh, sebaceous glands and, and hair follicles and, and keratinized lining and in all the hair centrally. So not a hard diagnosis to make. This is an interesting condition I've seen a number of times in white-tailed deer. This is peritoneal fibrosis, a diffuse fibrosis, a dense white covering that, that uh, aggregates, accumulates all the abdominal viscera into a big ball like this. This is very thick, tenacious material. I mean, you could take your two hands or your, your, your two feet and, and try and split the, the mesentery, the omentum, and normally that being a fatty tissue comes apart very readily, but here you've got massive, chronic, mature fibrous fib fibrosing uh, material there that, that you just can't tear it apart. And we speculate that this is due to some type of abdominal trauma, perhaps uh, you know, antler-related activity during fighting, perhaps hunting-related activity to a, a bullet shot or an arrow that, that, that nick the abdomen but not cause any, any uh, mortality, didn't hit any critical tissues and so it just walled off and these things seem to have a very active pleural surface, uh, mesothelial peritoneal surface just as cows do and it, it just keeps going and scarring, getting worse and worse until you reach this end stage here. This is a section through the liver and you can see the liver capsule has uh, maybe a centimeter of, of thick fibrous connective tissue completely encasing it. Here's a, a loop of uh, small intestine, a loop of bowel, and, and you really cannot make out anything of the underlying uh, serosa, the vessels, any, any aspect of the intestine. It's just massively covered with this dense fibrous connective tissue. It's interesting, human beings uh, that used to have renal failure and before we had good dialysis machines to plug into and, and take the blood out and purify them. They used to do a lot of peritoneal dialysis where they'd run fluid through your abdomen and use your, your peritoneal membrane as a method of dialysis. They would develop the exact same thing over a chronic period of time, this massive peritoneal fibrosis that glom all your intestinal viscera together like this. This next condition, I want to show you first a normal adult elk with his normal uh, antlers here. The antlers are large, prominent. They have individual tines going up to points. They're hard, smooth, uh, glistening surface, which is typical of a normal antler. And in comparison, these are one of two antlers taken off the head of a dead elk found in the woods. He'd been dead for some time, and this just, just the head with these uh, very abnormal antlers who rot to me and the question was posed, well, what, what is this? What caused this? This is where it attached to the base of the skull and it goes up and you can see massive thickened uh, honeycomb proliferation. This is hard. This is bone. However, it has a very irregular, funny surface. It does not have smooth surface. It does not have tines or points. It's just a huge club-like mass weighing dozen or more kilograms in weight. And this was a bilateral condition, although it was different on each side. Here's the opposite horn. So the question is, you know, what, what, what caused this uh, antler de degenerative condition? And I had not seen anything like this before, nor had the wildlife biologists I work with. So I went to the library, and lo and behold, there are three two-inch thick books on, on antlers, antler growth, antler changes. And I was eventually able to deduce that these were antleromas. Antleroma is, is named like a tumor, however, it's not truly a tumor. It's an acquired, uncontrolled proliferation. 
of the antler bone and it occurs in a male deer that is already growing antlers and then something happens to his testicles. Either they are castrated while the antler is in place or they have a severe degenerative disease, say a orchitis maybe due to uh, brucella canis or, or, or brucellosis and it causes uncontrolled proliferation of hair because you do need the normal testosterone in order one to control the growth and secondly to cause the antlers to be shed. So uh, even though all I had was the head and the antlers on here, I was able to diagnose that this thing had a severe uh, testicular problem in this elk, but a very unusual malformation here, thickened, irregular, heavy honeycomb growth of the antlers. And uh, this is a, a roe deer. The roe deer get, gets severe changes. This is experimentally. Here's the eye and the ear. And his antlers almost look like a melting ice cream cone. They're just very, very thick, and they're just proliferating uncontrolled. and. So this is actually more of a metabolic endocrine condition than it is a, a, a true tumor condition. But uh, antlers are, are fairly unique in our wildlife and they're subject to intensive study by uh, carcinogenesis because it is such a rapidly growing, rapidly replaced tissue. Uh, very significant, you know, several feet long, uh, m many kilograms in weight, very significant subportion of the body, 5-10% of the body weight. And so this is an area of active research going on. This was a, a, a two or three year old captive whitetail deer and the owner of this pen noticed over about a two year period it had the enlarging, slowly growing mass along the mandible here and so he culled this animal out of the herd and asked me to take a look at it and I first looked at this mass and said well you know this is going to be osteomyelitis, you think about lumpy jaw which is relatively common in deer, you think about a tooth root abscess and, and the resulting mandibular osteomyelitis. However, this turned out to be something uh, completely different. This was a tumor, a benign cranial osteoma on, on the mandible here. And you can see a uh, very large proliferative. Actually, it's coming off the maxilla. But it, it's coming off. Uh, it's all exophytic proliferative bone. It's very mature bone. It has good osteoid, good uh, haversion canals. Everything looked very normal. No atypy in there. There was no evidence of inflammation. Cultures were negative. So this was not an osteomyelitis, but these are the differentials you should consider. So really any, any kind of a tumor or mass or, or problem you have in your domestic animals, you can have the same condition present in our wildlife. Another interesting tumor-like condition. I've seen this three or four times in, in wild white-tailed deer. This is at the uh, distal tip of the uh, mandibular physis where it comes together and you can see this is a large flattened mass and it has literally dozens of incisor teeth present misdirected in all directions. This is a compound odontoma, uh, probably more of a malformation than a, than a true neoplasm again, but, but we do get ne odontomas like this with uh, greatly increased numbers of teeth, misdirected teeth. On cut section, these, these teeth are uh, look to be somewhat misshapen, but they're really not that far off from a normal incisor tooth. On cut section, these teeth are not only present on the outer surface of it, but also going down into the underlying connective tissue and even into the bone. So, so this is an interesting, uh, like a fetal rest, mal malformation that occurs and we call them a compound odontoma when they recapitulate the normal microanatomy we have dentin we have uh, cementum we have all the normal layers of the teeth in a normal arrangement this is a captive bear southeastern southeast asian bear asiatic bears in captivity in north america at the end of their lives, when they expire, when they're necropsy, they all have the exact same tumor. They have a cholangiocarcinoma of the extrahepatic bile duct. So this, this bear was presented on the necropsy floor, and I saw that it was icteric, and I had made the diagnosis of this particular tumor before I over opened it up. You can see here grossly everything is very yellow, very icteric. There's a, a somewhat distended gallbladder, but then we have multiple tumor masses that have metastasized throughout the liver. Some of these are depressed or umbilicated, which are fairly classic for cholangiocarcinomas. Another view here, and, and yeah, you can see a, a pretty normal gallbladder here, but then you have these extra hepatic bile masses and then metastatic masses in all lobes, including a fairly large mass right here of this liver.
We don't know what causes this. It seems to be a disease of captivity. Uh, like I said, Asiatic bears, uh, sun bears, sloth bears, Malaysian bears. We do not see this in our North American bears, nor do we see it over in Southeast Asia. So it seems to be some portion of their captivity that they're not responding to. The nutritional demands are not being met properly. Perhaps they're being exposed to some uh, contaminants, some natural mycotoxin in the feed that they don't get exposed to in Southeast Asia. But uh, according to the latest figures I've looked at, every single Southeast Asian bear ever on exhibit in North American Zoo, final post-mortem diagnosis was this cholangiocarcinoma. So really, uh, there's nothing that unusual. Probably the only thing I've presented here is the antleroma, and, and we simply don't get those in domestic animals because we don't have domestic animals with antlers. But the same types of bacterial, viral, parasitic conditions, the, the same type of neoplastic conditions that we see in our, our domestic animals, we can see those same things in, in wildlife, and therefore we should not be afraid to work with these. And now I'm going to switch over to carousel three to our uh, wild bird pathology. Wild birds, we're going to go through in the, the same manner as the mammals. We'll start with viruses, then bacteria, parasites, and, and move on to miscellaneous diseases. So starting here with viral diseases. And one of the major diseases we see very routinely are pox viruses in birds. Pox viruses, there are very many different avian pox viruses. You're all familiar with chickens having fowl pox and turkeys having turkey pox, but virtually each, each family or, or group of birds has their own pox virus. So there is a quail pox, there's a raptor pox, there's a penguin pox, junco pox, starling pox, uh, all these different strains that are more or less specific to a, a discrete family of birds. Grossly, you're going to see these most prominently on the non-feathered skin. That's how they show up, although the feathered skin can have them as well. They're just, just less visible. Two basic forms are presented. The dry form, which is the external skin form, cutaneous form. And then there's the uh, more internal mucous membrane form in the upper GI, upper respiratory. We call this wet pox. They're all characterized by similar type lesion, multifocal proliferative nodules. They go through the, the typical stages of, of, of pox viruses with uh, increasing uh, size. And this happens to be the head of a quail that has some periocular nodules consistent with pox virus. See the little nodules on the eyelid and the periocular tissue? This is a duck. He's got some larger nodules around his bill. Here's a uh, morning dove with pigeon pox. The, the doves and pigeons very commonly get, and you can see how severe this is, the base of the bill, around the eyes, almost obscuring the eyes. Here it's even traveled down, and we can see it over the, the skin on the forearm and the neck, and, and so this is an advanced form, and this could result in death. This bird may have trouble seeing where it's going, fly into something, and cause a traumatic death. Here's a... Uh, Starling that has the uh, starling or blackbird pox. Multiple nodules along its face, base of its bill. A very severe disseminated form here. It's along its neck. It's out on the tips of its arms. It's down along the, the, the trunk, along the neck and the, the uh, breast muscle. This is the wet form I talked about. This is the more severe form of it when it starts to go inside. This is at the uh, upper part of the trachea and the, the oropharynx uh, area and, and you get this large multi-nodular proliferative mass. This can occlude the airway, cause respiratory distress, it can cause a, a severe inappetence due to pos possibly due to blockage or possibly due to pain and uncomfortable with uh, swallowing its feed. So, so these are associated with some mortality in the uh, wet form compared to the dry. Here's a wild turkey. We do see turkey pox in our wild turkeys, and you can see very large nodules here. These are induced by a pox virus, and they will, with cell-mediated response, atrophy and, and, and dry up and, and go away after a period of time if the bird does not succumb to the disease. Very important disease that we see in wild waterfowl is known as duck plague or duck viral enteritis. This is uh, out west at one of the large national parks that has 
sporadic uh, epizootic die-offs of huge numbers of waterfowl. This is due to a herpes virus, which affects all, all types of waterfowl, ducks, geese, and swans, although different species of duck, breed of duck, will, will be less or more resistant to the disease than others. Gross lesions to look for include hemorrhagic and necrotizing uh, enteritis, a hepatitis, splenitis. Ducks have a, a rather unusual distribution of lymphoid tissue along their gut. They're kind of band-like distri distribution segmentally along the gut. They call them the annular bands. These annular bands will often be necrotic and hemorrhagic. You can have bloody discharges from, from openings on the bill or at the vent. And one of the typical uh, signs in a male duck is a prolapsed phallus. This is a very acute disease. This duck was, was walking along the, the shore in the snow here and, and just dropped dead in, in a bill down position, so it can be very per acute. Here's the uh, bloody discharge. It will accumulate serosanguinous discharges in different body cavities and the pleura and the peritoneal cavities. And, and if you tilt these upside down, you may get this bloody kind of discharge dripping right out of the uh, nares. Here's in the male, the typical prolapsed phallus. This is the entire small intestinal tract laid out, and you can see these large, rounded, very hemorrhagic areas. These are the annular bands, those accumulations of lymphoid aggregates I was telling you about that kind of unique to waterfowl. This is a lymphotropic disease, and it will preferentially cause necrosis and hemorrhage in those areas with a significant lymphoid depletion. Here's the uh, paired cica on the, the main part of the uh, intestinal tract and the paired cica, and you can see a nice hemorrhagic and necrotizing enteritis. This is the uh, gizzard proventricular junction here, and this is a very classic area to get erosions and hemorrhage at with duct viral enteritis or duct plague. Our next disease is marble spleen disease. This occurs in pheasants, most notably ring-neck pheasant, but uh, there are upwards of 30 different species of pheasant, including peacocks or peafowl, or simply a, a larger member of the pheasant family. All of these are susceptible. In addition, guinea fowl are also susceptible to this disease. It's an avian adenovirus. Avian adenoviruses are, are classed in several different groups. This is a group two avian adenovirus. Uh, pheasants, peafowl, as I mentioned, uh, turkeys also get a, a little different form of this disease known as hemorrhagic enteritis. However, that's primarily in domestic uh, turkeys, so we're not going to spend much time on that. Gross signs, a typical gross line is a very much enlarged, mottled, or marbled spleen, hence the name marble spleen disease. These birds actually more commonly do not die of pulmonary edema, massive uh, pulmonary effusions. And in, in turkeys only, we get a hemorrhagic enteritis associated with this particular virus. Here is the lung from a pheasant that died. You can see this lung is, is very heavy, wet edematous. There's a, a, a fluid exudate coming out around the lungs onto the background here. And this is actually the cause of death with marble spleen disease. The classic lesion here, this is a normal control pheasant, and these are three pheasants that were inoculated five days earlier with marble spleen disease, and you can see one marked splenomegaly, two, three, up to four, five times bigger than normal by weight, and you can see this pallor. It starts out as little individual nodules until which become completely confluent, and the, the entire spleen is very pale. This is due to the so-called reticular endothelial RE cell hyperplasia. These are tissue-bound macrophages surrounding the small splenic vessels, and these become markedly proliferative, as well as having the uh, typical intranuclear inclusions. On cut section, you can see that this uh, splenic marbling or modeling extends throughout the entire parenchyma. It's not just a surface change, but you get this round, confluent RE hyperplasia throughout the entire parenchyma of the spleen. This is a sick quail affected with quail bronchitis. This is another avian adenovirus, this one in the group 1 adenoviruses. Bobwhite quail are particularly susceptible. Can cause a tracheitis, a bronchitis, hepatitis, and an air sacculitis. So this is a, just kind of a 
poor, rundown, sick quail that has these fluffed up feathers, which is typical with the general signs of illness in a bird. We've opened up this bird's neck. His head is off to the right here. This is the trachea. And along the trachea, through the uh, serosal surface here, you can see these underlying large pale plaques present on the mucosal surface, indicating fibronecrotizing tracheitis. And they will extend not only into the trachea, but down into the major airways, the bronchi and bronchioles. In the other place you'll see this virus affecting typically is the liver. This is somewhat of an enlarged red friable liver with multiple pale scattered random foci and necrosis. And then the liver is the typical classic place to see your nice intranuclear eosinophilic inclusions of this disease, particularly within the hepatocytes. It's a new disease to, to North America in the last five years. This is West Nile virus, and, and there will be questions on the board exam on this, as it is a new emerging disease, and it does affect wildlife, domestic animals, and man. So I just thought I'd show you a few slides here. This is in the flavivirus family, uh, closely associated with Japanese encephalitis group. Highest mortality, and the, the principal avian hosts are crows and other corvids, including ravens and blue jays. These animals actually just drop from the sky uh, by the hundreds and thousands, and they will have minimal to no gross or histologic lesions because the virus kills them so quickly. But we found in some of the larger raptor birds, particularly the owls, that they do get severe clinical signs. This is a uh, live great horn owl, and a normal great horn owl would never sit in a hunched over position. Normally they, they uh, sit up rather erect and upright. He's also ataxic. You see the wings are, are spread out. They're trying to hold his balance there. These birds have great difficulty flying. They develop a twist to the neck, torticollis, opistotinus, may have tremors. Now we've released them, and no uh, normal great horned owl is going to be in this position, just laying here on the table with his wings out to the side. You might be able to appreciate that there's a, a bit of a head tilt and a little anisocoria, a little difference in the size of the pupils here, so some nice CNS lesions accompanying this viral disease. And uh, it's also in these animals that we actually see some gross pathology we simply don't see in the crows, but here's a nice case of pale multifocal decoalescing, necrotizing myocarditis, these large pale foci here in the uh, cut back the uh, pericardial sac, and you can see we've got some actual fibrinous adhesions, some pericarditis and fibrinous adhesions present here. So the principal organs that uh, we go after in these cases, we, we like the heart, the liver, the kidney, and the brain are, are very good organs to go after. Uh, typically right now when we're doing large numbers of these as surveillance, we would uh, do routine histopathology, we do immunohistochemistry as a confirmatory test. There's, there's good uh, non-specific uh, immunohistochemical markers in the Japanese encephalitis virus family. And then if those came up positive and pointed us toward West Nile, then we'd actually do a RT-PCR on, on kidney and or uh, heart and come up with a definitive diagnosis. This is spreading rapidly across the country and, and should be in all 48 contiguous states by the end of this coming year. And, and we see many other uh, birds and mammal species affected. Chilean flamingos are extremely susceptible in a zoo setting, and these die very rapidly. Corvids, uh, raptors, not just owls, but different types of hawks. There's a wide variety of different animals and, and birds that are affected. These are cormorants, which are colony nesting water birds, fish eating birds, and they're quite susceptible to Newcastle disease, which is in the Paramyxo family. Everyone's familiar with Newcastle, particularly in, in light of the uh, recent exotic Newcastle outbreak on the west coast in California. But uh, we have Newca Newcastle endemic in this country in our waterfowl up and down the Mississippi Flyway. You test our waterfowl, our gulls, our cormorants, and they all have high antibody levels against this. And we have uh, sporadic epizootic outbreaks, uh, significant mortality, particularly in these colonial birds, these cormorants in the Great Lakes. When uh, this, this uh, virus is tested out, it's considered velogenic, which is the bad form. You know, there's, there's me. Lentigenic, which is mild, mesogenic, which is intermediate, and, and velogenic, which is the severe uh, high mortality form. However, as opposed to exotic Newcastle, which is VVND, visertropic velogenic, this is 
neurotropic velogenic, so it's, it's uh, not quite as bad, I suppose, as, in that it keeps our borders open for exportation of poultry products. This is a uh, juvenile bird. The juvenile bird's uh, nestlings and, and recent fledglings are most susceptible, and you can see this is a very unhappy bird. He's in an unkept state here. His feathers are crusted with all kinds of fecal material, and he's very depressed. A normal cormorant wouldn't let you walk up and get this close to him. But the highest mortality is, is the nestling still on the nest, and, and there would just be large numbers of these dead nestlings all around during one of these outbreaks. Number of clinical signs, diarrhea, torticollis, paralysis, gross signs we're looking for, widespread hemorrhages, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly. This, this is an open cormorant, and it, it shows a, a rather enlarged and, and somewhat mottled liver here that has some... Uh, Hepatic necrosis associated, can have lymphoid atrophy and a hemorrhagic enteritis, and, and these are similar to some of the signs we see in our, our domestic poultry that have a velogenic type of Newcastle disease. This is a uh, cecum with uh, necrotizing and hemorrhagic tiflitis, maybe some uh, scattered erosions and ulcers as well. And the way we classify these, these viruses are, are actual bird experiments where we take 10 birds and we inoculate of them, some intracerebrally and some cloacally and, and, and IV, and then we look at uh, the high percentage of mortality as well as the clinical signs and the number of hours it takes and et cetera, and that's how we come up with these different uh, types, lentogenic, mesogenic, velogenic, as well as whether it's viscerotropic, neurotropic, or otherwise. So this is the testing that goes on at the National Veterinary Services Lab in Ames, Iowa. We're going to shift from viruses into bacteria now for birds. And the first uh, bacteria disease we're going to cover is avian cholera, which is caused by Pastorella multocida. We've already encountered this in our wild mammals. In birds, it particularly affects waterfowl, crows, game birds, raptors. Grossly, we see a, a fairly classic septicemia, which is a fair, fairly nonspecific. You can see multifocal necrotizing hepatitis, again a nonspecific lesion, epicardial hemorrhages, and, epi and uh, enteric hemorrhage and necrosis. So, so a variety of signs of septicemia that are fairly nonspecific. You do, do need to do bacterial culture in order to confirm the disease. This is a set of lungs that's not uh, totally normal here. They're covered on their pleural surface with a lot of fibrin. There's modeling, there's hemorrhage. These lungs are, are, are more firm and consolidated than normal, so we've got a pretty good pleural pneumonia going on here. We've got a uh, heart lesion here characterized by a epicarditis. So this, this heart is, is actually removed from the pericardial sac, but it's hard to appreciate because there is this, this fibrinous epicarditis that's covering some of the cirrhosal surface here. Here's a liver. This liver is enlarged, a patomegaly, and it has these little tiny white foci, so it's multifocal necrotizing hepatitis, randomly scattered. Again, a fairly nonspecific. We've seen this many times, but certainly we should think about a septicemia or a viremia when we see this type of multifocal necrotizing hepatitis. Splenomegaly, the spleen is, is many times its normal size, and it also has multifocal necrosis characterized by the small white foci scattered throughout the parenchyma here. This is the GI tract, and we can see segmental areas of hemorrhage and necrosis along the mucosal lining. Next disease, new duct disease, another bacterial disease caused by Rhymerella, it was previously known as Pasteurella, anatopestifer, affects uh, waterfowl, primarily ducks. Gross lesions include a fibrinous polycerositis, a pericarditis, perihepatitis, air sacculitis, and meningitis. We're looking here at the open chest cavity of a duck, and this heart is all obs but obscured by the severe fibrinous epicarditis, pericarditis that's going on here. This causes a, a real fibrinous polycerositis uh, analogous to what we might see in pigs suffering from uh, Haemophilus parasuus or strep suus. Here's an open duct, and now we're looking into the abdominal cavity, and we can see that this liver is, is partially obscured by, by heavy fibrinous exudates over the surface of it. 
another uh, couple of organs from, from ducks here. You can have, see some uh, multifocal uh, necrosis and, and fibrin on the surface of the heart, as well as some multifocal necrotizing hepatitis here. And this is a uh, example of the air sacs. You can see ribs here, and, and, and we're looking down into the cranial abdominal air sacs, and they're, they're almost completely obscured by all the massive amounts of fibrin exuded over the surfaces. Okay, we're going to move into avian tuberculosis. Avian TB is caused by a couple of different organisms. Classically, we think about uh, Mycobacterium avium. However, in, in recent years, in the last five to ten years, we've seen a new organism, Mycobacterium genovense, which has turned out to be a, a very big problem in uh, pet birds and zoo birds and, and more and more in wildlife. It's, it's particularly a problem over in Europe, although we're starting to see some of it in the United States as well. All birds are susceptible to a greater or lesser extent to the uh, avian mycobacteria. Grossly, these birds are, show evidence of chronic infection, so they're emaciated. This particular bird is a very little body fat on, on open section here. You can also see that it has uh, multifocal pale granulomas scattered throughout its liver parenchyma. Little pale, these are somewhat raised if you were a little closer, if you had this in real instead of picture. You'd see that these are, are bulging granulomas due to infiltrate. Uh, we see diarrhea with this disease, uh, disseminated granulomas in virtually any organ. And then we also see some, some unusual manifestations. But let's go through the, the more typical ones first. This is a kidney from a, a wild bird that has very large, pale granulomas. You'd be hard-pressed to tell this from avian lymphoma, so you'd have to differentiate that. But, the, but these are, are quite prominent and, and coalescing in the kidneys. It uh, very commonly goes into the bone marrow of the bones. And you can see two uh, pale granulomas in the, in the bone marrow here. The way it, it probably enters the bones preferentially in, in birds compared to mammals is the fact that we have these uh, air sacs in birds. They extend out into certain of the bones, pneumatic bones, and so you have ready distribution. If you have a pulmonary form, a respiratory form of this, it'll get from the lungs into the air sacs and hence out into the bone marrow cavity with very little resistance that way. The GI tract is frequently involved. This is a little different in mammals. We talked about tuberculosis being primarily an airborne respiratory infection. However, in the rest of them, a, the uh, animal kingdom, birds, reptiles, fish, it's predominantly a GI infection. It's predominantly fecal oral infection that transmit it. And so you're going to have very commonly see these granulomas, pale granulomas, scattered throughout the GI tract at all levels. These often will, will have like a, a central caseonecrotic core that's discharging the organism in large numbers out into the feces. And in fact, uh, fecal culture is probably your best bet right now for making a diagnosis in the bird antemortem because there are no good skin tests developed, save for the chicken. And, and so uh, you need other methodologies for making a diagnosis. Here's the liver with classic multifocal granulomas. Remember I said that they are somewhat raised. They're also uneven in size. They're not like your little multifocal necrotocrosis that's flat or depressed and uniform. These are, are more coalescing and more raised and irregular on their surface. An unusual manifestation we had a few years ago at a uh, bald eagle. I'd been captive in a zoo for many years and off of its uh, intestinal tract had multiple large diverticula with this dried out, inspissated, uh, ingested fecal type of contents and the walls with this crumbly kind of granulominous inflammation and so we did uh, histopathology and cultures and this was an unusual manifestation of av M. avian infection and in fact the older literature talks about this in the old days when they're far more in poultry than there is now with the higher biosecurity, the more rapid flock turnover, they talked about these diverticulosis in association with chronic M. avium in our poultry. Another uh, unusual manifestation, the skin form of tuberculosis in birds and cytosine captive birds, it can be just in the skin or more commonly, I think, and, and particularly in the wildlife, the skin is a, a sign of advanced dissemination throughout the, the internal viscera. This is right at the uh, elbow joint on the wing of an eagle. 
had a large white granulomatous mass that we took biopsies from and then uh, eventually removed the entire mass. And uh, we were hoping it was just a skin form, but uh, it turned out to be a very disseminated form. And so it terminally, as this becomes more and more advanced, it disseminates out along the blood vessels to virtually every tissue, including the skin. Uh, the final unusual manifestation of avian tuberculosis that I want to talk about is in uh, waterfowl. Wild waterfowl, this was reported by Dr. Roth in uh, Avian Diseases back in uh, 1989, and he had several cases of redhead and canvasback ducks that had uh, cysts on their liver, unusual kind of multiple cystic fluid-filled cavities. When he did histopathology on these, he found that the walls of the cysts consisted of a granulomatous inflammation. And within that granulomatous inflammation were large numbers of tuberculosis organisms, acid fast M. avium, which they were able to culture out of there. So this is a very unusual, it's only been reported the one time out of a handful of ducks, but it just goes to show you that tuberculosis can involve virtually any tissue in the body. Typical manifestations are granulomas, however, you also have to think about some unusual things, diverticula and cystic uh, cavitations, and these are all different manifestations of a very long time. Uh, we're reviewing the uh, diseases of wild birds, particularly the bacterial agents, and right now we're going to turn our attention to avian salmonellosis or paratyphoid disease. This uh, disease is caused by a wide variety of Salmonella species. However, Salmonella typhimurium is, is one of the most frequently associated with this problem. All birds are susceptible to uh, Salmonellosis, and we see particularly uh, outbreaks around winter bird feeders where we bring in uh, large numbers of different species and abnormally high concentrations. They're all feeding together, passing feces together, and, and, and creating a nice place for uh, transmission of disease to occur. Gross lesions include uh, fibrinonecrotizing esophagitis, engluvitis, enteritis, hepatitis, tiflitis, and caseogranuloma is present in virtually any tissue. So you can see this tends to be a very widespread disease, often centered on a GI tract initially because it is a fecal oral contamination, but then, then disseminating out to many different organs. This is a young pigeon, what you might call a squab, and this particular squab has a very distended pot belly appearance here. When you open up the uh, abdominal cavity, you can appreciate marked hepatomegaly modeling uh, due to some necrosis and some inflammatory infiltrates present within the parenchyma of the spleen. So a fairly typical necrotizing hepatitis here. Here's another bird. Uh, this, this liver maybe shows you a little modeling, not quite as nice as the first one, but it's interesting if you look at the pancreas here. In the proximal loop of the duodenum always contains your pancreas, and you can see one, two, three pale foci where uh, necrosis of the pancreas due to salmonellosis is occurring. I talked about those uh, winter bird feeders and the die-offs associated. But here's a couple of uh, sparrows here, and what we've done is open up the crop, the uh, small dilatation at the base of the esophagus just before it enters the thoracic cavity. We've opened the skin first, and we've opened the crop, and this is a very unnatural, unusual yellow fibrinous lining here. It's a fibrinonecrotizing ingluvitis caused by salmonellosis, and, and we found in our hands that this is almost pathognomonic. I haven't seen this with other disease agents in wild birds with die-offs. Certainly, ingluvitis can be associated with uh, fungal infections such as candidiasis. It can be associated with parasites, trichrichomonas uh, protozoa, or with uh, capillaria nematode worms. It can be uh, a, a white thickening associated with vitamin A deficiency. So there's a number of things. But if you have an infectious disease with a die-off in wild birds and you see this type of fibrinonecrotizing ingluvitis, the first thing on your list should be salmonellosis. So another fairly recent emergent disease came into the United States, so probably 10 or 12 years ago now, first seen in the suburbs around Washington, D.C., and it's been spreading rapidly out up and down the East Coast and out to the Midwest and, and points beyond over the last few years. This is mycoplasma conjunctivitis. 
present uh, predominantly in, in finches, house finches, purple finches, gold finches. There's occasional reports in other birds, grosbeaks, etc. But it, it seems to be these seed-eating birds characterized by the large bill for breaking through the seeds here. So these finches, this indeed is a purple finch here. And a characteristic gross lesion is marked periorbital swelling and conjunctivitis significant drainage in this area. There may also be a little distension of the uh, periorbital sinus area, so we could have some sinitis, some rhinitis, along with the conjunctivitis. This disease is caused by Mycoplasma galisepticum, known as MG and, and a common disease in, in the poultry uh, area. So we already talked about the gross, the conjunctival swelling, ocular discharge, or oh, we may get a little crusting around the nares as well if there's a rhinitis involved. And this certainly poses a, somewhat of a threat if it's a endemic in our wild birds for getting back into uh, our domestic poultry, although studies on it have shown it's not as pathogenic in the poultry as it is, so this seems to be kind of a specific strain as it is in the wild birds. Another wild bird affected a little less severely, but he's still got that, that periorbital swelling and discharge and conjunctivitis. This is a goldfinch here. Quail disease or ulcerative enteritis. It's a group of bobwhite quail. They're, they're exhibiting uh, diarrhea more than usual for this number of birds. It's runnier than usual. It doesn't have the nice separation of the urates and, and the fecal material. The birds themselves, except for the one in the front, have the kind of the uh, puffed up, fluffed out feathers. They're down on their hocks. They, they, they have closed eyes. These are all non-specific signs of diseased unhappy birds. This particular disease is caused by Clostridium colinum, a fairly fastidious, difficult to culture bird. However, in fact, the often gross and histopath is sufficient to make the diagnosis even if you don't have culture uh, capabilities. Bobwhite quail and other game birds, uh, chucker, partridge, pheasant can all be affected. Grossly, we see hemorrhagic, necrotizing, and ulcerative enteritis, and tiflitis, so the small intestine and cecum are involved. We can also see multifocal hepatitis with this disease. This is the serosal surface of the small intestine, and again, pale plaque-like areas indicating ulcers present in the underlying mucosa. Another one showing almost confluent ulcers here. They're so close together, and they're almost target-type lesions. Makes you think there is some three-dimensionality to them, that they're ulcers, not just superficial necrosis. And if we look at the uh, mucosal surface, you do indeed see these divots, ulcers present in mucosa associated with uh, mild fibrinonecrosis. And histologically, you'll usually be able to see uh, significant numbers of, of stout gram-positive clostridia bacilli with spores. So, so culture is not always really necessary in order to make a confirmed diagnosis. This is uh, liver from a bird with chlamydiosis, also known as ornithosis. In pet birds, it's known as psittacosis, although uh, we don't have any uh, parrot-like birds present in the United States, so we'll call it chlamydiosis. This is a very much enlarged hepatomegalic liver with these pale mottled areas on it, indicating areas of multifocal necrosis. This disease is caused by chlamydia psittaci. We see it in a number of wild birds, uh, waterfowl, pigeons, grossly uh, associated with conjunctivitis, sinusitis, enlarged spleens and livers, multifocal ne necrotizing hepatitis is, is shown here, and also with a, a fibrinous polycerositis. So it can, can manifest itself as a number of different uh, gross lesions. This is a spleen, believe it or not. It's a markedly enlarged and very pale necrotic spleen. Heart here, the heart is uh, within a partially open pericardial sac, and I think you can see present on the epicardial surface a nice white fibrinous epicarditis pericarditis, which is, is fairly typical of chlamydiosis. The lungs can be involved with a uh, mild pneumonia, and here grossly they're exhibiting a mottling and edema. Chlamydia is uh, a little difficult to make the diagnosis on. The uh, inclusions are, are very pale, basophilic, kind of 
are they really there or not within the cells typically in the uh, liver and spleen are the best places to look for them. Some people use some specialized stains, Jimenez, Gimza, Machiavella stains. Uh, other people use uh, egg inoculation, which is probably your best method of, of diagnosis. And of course, chlamydia is a human health threat, a zoonotic disease, and so we want to be aware of that factor and, and certainly report that when we come up with any positives. We're going to move next into parasites, and again, parasites are a very large problem in wildlife. This is a uh, pigeon, and we're looking into his uh, opened up uh, oral cavity here. And there's a large plaque or fibronecrotic plaque present in the oral cavity. Could be a number of things. It could be the wet form of pox. It could be a, a lot of different things. But in this case, and particularly since it is a pigeon, we have to think about trichomonas or canker. Uh, pigeons, of course, feed their young by they form a uh, milk-like substance in their esophagus, which they store in the crop, and then they regurgitate that to their young. So they're about the only bird that has that kind of crop milk and that uh, ideal environment for passing tritrichomonas, which tends to live in the oral cavity, esophagus, and crop. And so the adults have a subclinical infection. Very rapidly, they'll spread that infection to the, to the young, which are less immune and, and therefore develop significant lesions. This is caused by the uh, protozoal parasite Tritrichomonas gallinae. And again, like I said, we see it in pigeons and doves because of this crop milk feeding behavior. We also see it in raptors, and in raptors rather than canker, they refer to it as fronts. Grossly, uh, necrosis, caseogranulomas present as plaque-like uh, lesions in the oral cavity, esophagus, and crop are the main areas. Here's a crop from bird uh, pigeon that has multiple raised plaque-like and again, these would be very difficult to tell from uh, wet form of pox, but histology is usually diagnostic. Another protozoal disease of birds is histomoniasis, or blackhead. Blackhead tends to target two main organs, the cica and the liver. It is caused by histomonas meleagridis. We see this in turkeys, both domestic and wild. This is a wild turkey with uh, real severe target-like lesions. And this is classic for uh, histomoniasis. It, it looks like a target on a bullseye at a shooting arrow range as opposed to a, a, a normal intact granuloma. You know, we've got red, red, white, red is, is very classic. You're not always seen, but, but when it's present, it's very typical for histomoniasis. Other game birds, in addition to turkeys, you can also get it in, in pheasants and, and partridge, etc. Target lesions are necrosis, and here are the uh, typical cecal lesions. This is the other spot where the parasite lives. It causes these caseogranulomatous, cheesy-like cores that fill and distend. So on the top, we have a uh, cecum that's closed, and you can see it's distended and firm, and on cut section, it's all this caseonecrotic material from the superficial necrosis going on in the uh, mucosa, and you can usually find significant numbers of organisms, whether by uh, the cecum or the liver on histopathology. Breast muscle from a duck with a fairly classic case of sarcocystosis or sarcosporidiosis. We've seen these earlier in mammals, but they reach their uh, full glory, I think, in birds where they form these very large, and you talk about linear cysts, but these are even bigger than rice grains here. These are more maggot size, if, if you like that type of analogy, but can be very, very heavy, very severe. Usually is considered an incidental finding. In waterfowl, uh, Sarcocystis rileyi is the particular species of the protozoan parasite, although there are other species that are present in, in chickens and in other types of birds. Very large, pale cylindrical cysts, and the uh, pectoral muscle is where they're most prominent because this is the largest bird muscle on the bird's body and also where we tend to, when we skin them out, this is what we see first. But you can have them in other muscles including the uh, thigh muscle. Here's a very severe infection. I mean it looks like most of the muscle is taken over by the sarcocystis uh, parasite. Uh, however, it usually does not interfere with flight or anything. Uh, very occasionally you'll have marked necrosis and degeneration and it can stimulate a inflammatory response around it. But uh, generally considered subclinical, although if you went out and shot one of these as a waterfowl hunter, this is probably not the breast you want to put on the kitchen table to eat either. Coccidiosis, 
Obviously, Cox City is a major problem in our domestic animals, our mammals, our chickens, our turkeys. Well, it's, it's certainly present in our wild birds as well, although the wild birds being more spread out, they don't tend to build up such high levels of infection, but they certainly can run into problems, particularly as uh, nestlings where they're staying together, groups of them with their parents, and you get that uh, adult to juvenile transmission. These are the cirrhosal surfaces of uh, small intestine, pale plaques, which indicate areas of uh, hyperplasia and or necrosis of the underlying epithelium with the uh, coccidia organisms present in there. The species uh, varies by the bird, but they're all Imeria species in birds. Another protozoal infection, and unfortunately there are no real gross lesions, so I have to give you a histopath on this one. This is leukocytozoonosis. Leukocytozoon simondi is the one that's present in waterfowl. It's endemic in waterfowl and ducks and geese. I know in northern Michigan in the uh, Sunny National Water well, Wildlife Refuge, they say that virtually all the ducklings uh, that are on in the nests up there are infected with this. 75, 90 percent of them are infected. Grossly, uh, we can see anemia, weakness, sometimes splenomegaly. This is in the, the young birds, the juvenile nestling birds, and it does result in mortality. Adult birds, are, it's pretty much a subclinical infection, and they simply carry this uh, protozoan disease organism. This organism infects individual cells, fibroblasts, and these fibroblasts become enlarged many hundreds of times, and so this is marked karyomegaly of the nucleus, and then the outer cytoplasm is filled with these paley basophilic inclusions, which are just tons and tons of the uh, infectious uh, organisms, the, the zoite stage, and these rupture and release. And then the other place you'll find them besides fibroblasts, which can be in any organ, this by the way happens to be the uh, glandular mucosa of the proventriculus, but you can see them in the brain, you can see them in the GI tract, liver, kidney, you name it. And the other place we see this uh, as a problem is, is the uh, other stage that goes through in the red cells and the white cells. And so this can cause significant anemia and uh, leukopenia causing immunosuppression in birds. So particularly in a young bird, it can be a problem, but generally an incidental finding in adults. Here's a couple of claws off, a, I think this is a pheasant, but it could be off, you know, virtually any bird. Pa pale to dark, raised, powdery, hyperplastic lesion caused by the scaly leg mite, proliferation and crusting or scales. This is due to Nemodicoptes mutans, affects a wide variety of game birds and songbirds proliferative and crusting dermatitis of the legs. Generally a incidental finding, although it's certainly uh, irritating to the birds. It can cause cracking and splitting in the scales there and can allow, allow secondary infections to develop bacterial infections such as bumblefoot. Here's a uh, quail with his esophagus opened up and we're looking at a case of capillariasis or crop worms. Capillaria contorta or annulata are the two main species we see here. Affects the game birds, quail, grouse, pheasants, and partridge. Grossly, we see this, this white thickening, very prominent folds in the crop, and, and this general whitening and, and, and rugose uh, thickening of the esophagus may be associated with a catarrhal inflammation. And if you look at these uh, histologically, the capillaria worms live right in the outer mucosa. They get weave in and out like little tiny white threads there. You need like a, a 10x on a, a dissecting scope in order to appreciate the organisms. Here's a crop, very markedly hyperplastic, proliferative, hyperkeratinized. Again, you'd have to have in your differential tritrichomoniasis, uh, fungus candidiasis, you'd have to think about vitamin A deficiency causing some metaplasia, but if you see this in a game bird and it's predominantly in the crop, then the first thing you should think about is capillariasis. They're very thin worms. This is under high magnification, but they have the classic bipolar eggs, which makes for an easy diagnosis, and those are laid right in the uh, outer layers of the epithelium, and they're, they're very easy to find. Proventricular worms, we see these in a, a number of different species of birds. We see them in, in pheasants and, excuse me, pigeons and game birds like pheasants. We see them in waterfowl. This happens to be uh, dyspharynx, 
in a grouse. And we're looking here at the junction between the proventriculus and the gizzard. And we can see these white semicircular worms present in here. So this is this dyspharynx uh, nasuta. Generally an incidental finding, although high levels of this can cause some uh, poor doing, some poor growth, some, some general emaciation. A more severe problem is the one we see in the waterfowl, which is Tetrameres americanus. And this one can, with relatively low numbers of worms, present in the proventriculus. This is the uh, proventriculus opened up and we're looking down on the mucosal surface from above and you can see a half dozen of these kind of brown, orange-brown, kind of globoid looking. These look more like flukes than they look like nematodes, but these are in fact nematode parasites. These burrow down into the glands. They seem to secrete a uh, local toxin that causes uh, ileus. They, they don't eat much. These birds tend to get very emaciated. Actually, uh, fairly high mortality in wild, wild waterfowl affected with these, and they don't seem to cause that much inflammation or anything else. Here's a cross-section through the uh, proventriculus, and like I said, they, they can be out here on the mucosal surface, but more commonly you find them living down in the, the glands, the crypts of the glands here. And a few of these is, is enough to kill a, a large bird like a Canadian goose. Another important internal parasite that we want to look at is gape worm or tracheal worm. This is caused by Syngamus tracheae, which is present in game birds, or Cyathostoma bronchialis, which is present in geese. This happens to be a female pheasant here, and she's in the classic position of gape worm with her beak wide open, gasping for breath, her neck extended out, probably uh, pumping fairly severely in order to catch her, her breath there because this causes an obstructive lesion, dyspnea, tracheitis, and, and of course the associated presence of the worms themselves. Here we're looking at the trachea in unopened state, and we can see along the outer surface multiple granulomas in response to where the uh, gape worms have been attached and feeding. On open section, these gape worms are present. They literally look like little Ys. There's a large female that's usually filled with blood who's been feeding, and then a smaller male that's uh, hanging off the female. They're in a constant copulation there and, and producing uh, eggs this way. And, and so these are very irritating to the lining and can stimulate that granulomatous response that we saw in an earlier slide. This does cause significant emaciation and some mortality in game birds, and that's why uh, game birds are often either raised up off the ground on uh, wire or else the uh, larger game birds like pheasants have to be uh, treated routinely like every month or so with uh, antelmentics in order to prevent this from being a clinical problem. Okay, we're going to move away from the uh, parasites and go into some miscellaneous diseases and conditions that are important to know about in birds. First condition that you're probably all familiar with is aspergillosis or fungal infection in birds. This is an open goose, goose carcass here and we can see his ear sacs and lungs are are virtually covered with a uh, greenish white mat of fungal hyphae. Very similar to the mold, which is also aspergillus you might find in uh, growing on old bread in your refrigerator. Aspergillus fumigatus is the most typical species. All birds are susceptible, however, we see particularly uh, significant aspergillosis infections in waterfowl and raptors. It produces a multifocal granulomatous pneumonia, air sacculitis, cirrusitis, and you get these classic gray to green fungal plaques. These can be uh, infectious to people. We recommend either wearing a respirator or doing this underneath a biological hood when you open these up because as you open it, it releases all these, these uh, fruiting bodies, release all these airborne spores, and, and you don't necessarily need to inhale very many of these, particularly if you're immunosuppressed. You can see the, the severe multifocal granulomatous lesion present in the lungs here of an advanced case of aspergillosis. And you couldn't tell this from uh, advanced avian TB or some other things, but uh, if you had those fungal plaques along with it, that's a good indication that these are granulomas. And certainly on histologic section, you'll see myriads of the, the long hyphal septate forms of uh, fungal hyphae in here. This is a rib cage from an animal, and it's, you know, some uh, nice fungal plaque here. 
gray, green, white fungal plaque is, is classic for this disease. This is right on the surface of his lung itself. This is very much what we call an aerophilic organism. It loves air, and so you'll find it lining the trachea and major airways. You'll find it in the lungs or the air sacs. Anywhere there's, there's high levels of oxygen coming in, this is where you're going to get the uh, plaques forming. This is a fairly new disease. There's a good review article out in this in uh, Journal of Wildlife Diseases at the end of uh, 2002 by uh, Rock et al. And, and there certainly will be questions on the upcoming board exam on this, so I suggest you pay a little attention to this one. This is avian vacuolar myelinopathy. Went by a number of different uh, names over the years as we tried to figure out what it was. Coot and Eagle encephalopathy, uh, Cobles, there were a number of different synonymous names, but Avian vacuolar myelinopathy is the current name. This is a coot. A coot is merely one of many different types of uh, waterfowl. But uh, coots and eagles seem to be the two species most frequently affected and other waterfowl, other duck species as well. This disease is fairly unusual in that it's uh, limited to certain southeastern geographic foci. It occurs annually. It occurs seasonally, usually in the uh, late fall to the winter usually occurs on fairly recently made man-made lakes and reservoirs rather than natural bodies of water. It causes uh, CNS disease, uh, neurologic problems, paralysis, and, and fairly high mortality. This coot here, his one leg is, is more or less paralyzed and so he's paddling on one leg and, and we all know one paddle doesn't get you much anywhere but around in circles. There, there isn't much other than the neurologic uh, lesions grossly, but histologic is where it's characteristic. The white matter often of the optic tectum or the cerebellum is marked spongiosis change. It's this, this uh, white vacuolated appearance which is due to a uh, myelinopathy, edema and splitting of the myelin sheaths. A little closer look here at the white matter and uh, the base of the cerebellum. And you see this, this spongiosis which is, is due to the myelin uh, degeneration and edema. They don't know exactly what causes this. Uh, you can reproduce it by feeding affected uh, waterfowl to uh, raptors, so it seems to be some type of preformed toxin. They believe it's naturally occurring based on its seasonality and its distribution, but uh, lots of research gone on into this and they still don't have an answer. This is the EM, the myelin uh, sheets in the central nervous system develop huge vacuoles in them from edema and then you get this splitting and reduplication of the, the myelin into separate layers and then that's the characteristic ultrastructural appearance. This duck is suffering from lead poisoning. You know, lead is present in, in spent shot and, and uh, fishing sinkers. Uh, lead has been outlawed and shot in the uh, United States for 12 or 15 years I believe, but the problem is such massive amounts of shot and sinkers were left in the environment at the big hunting sites and things that they're still present there and it'll take uh, much longer than just a decade or two for this to get to the point where it's not found anymore. Remember these are mostly in dabbling ducks, the ducks that turn tail up, head down in the water and they sieve through the mud. That's what dabbling is and as they sieve through the mud they bring up shot and lead from, from years ago and they ingest it. And so they get different uh, lesions here. This particular duck has the green cast indicating cholestasis in his liver, which is very typical for acute lead toxicosis. They get uh, neurologic signs, including weakness, droop of the wing. Uh, it tends to be a chronic disease, so you get emaciation. See an increased green in the droppings due to increased bile excretion. May get impactions in the uh, GI tract due to uh, ileus and the inability to propel the food along. We've already seen the green liver discoloration, but we also get kind of a gray-green discoloration to the lining of the gizzard, often associated with, with cracks and, and peeling of the gizzard lining. And of course, you can actually find little lead objects, most typically in your, your gizzard here, whether they be shot or sinkers. And these are often, because they're highly malleable lead and they're easily dissolved, to be very uh, pitted and flattened and irregular in shape. You may not recognize them for what they are. This was a duck on a uh, study with different types of shot, including lead that had been inoculated with. And uh, you can see the wing droop here. The wings are just dragging along behind it. It's kind of a 
progressive paralysis. It, it hits the wings and the legs and finally the neck. Underside of a duck that uh, has uh, lead poisoning and you see the increased green in his, uh, around his vent and the droppings there, increased levels of bile. T tend to be in the chronic cases, a lot of emaciation. This is the breast muscle and the keel bone and we call this hatchet breast where it's got a very pronounced straight uh, sharp edge on that keel bone because the breast muscle is atrophied away with chronic emaciation. Gizzards here from a couple of infected birds and you can see this funny dark gray black discoloration and almost a green cast to it and sometimes you'll see some cracking or some ulceration of that gizzard lining. Oiling we certainly see uh, problems with, with man-made intervention, including oil spills, not as common in the Midwest as it is on the coastlines, but, but we still see it. You can see these two canvas back here have a significant amount of oil adherent to their feathers. Oiling causes a number of problems. Uh, you know, it's most obvious on the outside where they have these, these oil-soaked, ruffled feathers. It breaks down the normal ability of the feather to drive water off. You heard about uh, water off a duck's back. Well, the water just soaks right in here and they become bound down in, in, in the water and so they lose their ability to uh, maintain their body heat. They swim low in the water with just their head sticking out. They become hypothermic and chilled. Fair amount of mortality. They try and clean themselves by uh, running their feathers through the tip of their bill and, and pull the oil off there and all that does is, is get the oil on the inside where it's an irritant to the GI tract so we get uh, emaciation and GI uh, irritation, uh, hemorrhage, necrosis of the GI tract so it's a it's a big problem you gotta get these birds early after they've been exposed to oil have to go through a series of different gentle washes with, with a soap some type of product that'll break down the oil get it away from the feathers you have to dry them off, you have to get them warm, and, and you may well have to force feed them in order to get some energy and some fluid into them. Or, or, and even then, you just don't have very good success rate at, at these type of rehabilitation procedures. So the best thing is not to foul the environment with oil in the first place. Here's a gull laying on the shore. This gull has limber neck or botulism poisoning. You can see that the wings are kind of splayed out to the side. He's not got them tucked in in the normal position of a resting bird. and his his head is just kind of dangling there. He's not able to maintain himself. He's got wing paralysis due to the toxin present in Clostridium botulinum. I recognize that Clostridium is a bacterial disease, but uh, it's, it's really the preformed toxin that we're talking about here as opposed to the bacterial infection, so I choose to put it in the miscellaneous section here. We see it most commonly in waterfowl. That's probably because uh, we, we see botulism poisoning in kind of stagnant uh, ponds and, and waterways, particularly in the late summer, early fall. It's been very hot, it's been dry, things are stagnant, you get a lot of dying vegetation, you may get some dead carcasses along the shoreline, and, and then you get the maggots feeding on those, which tend to concentrate these clostridial toxins, and so it's a, it tends to be a little bit of a seasonal thing and, and more in the water type of birds. In addition to wing droop, uh, recumbency of the bird, limp neck, paralysis, and, and death is the usual course of things here. Not very amenable to treatment. Here's a duck swimming with the head down position. He can't get his bill out of, his wa out of the water, and that's because of the, the paralysis of the neck muscles. He can't raise his head up normally. Here's a Canada goose on the shoreline, and again, he's got that limber neck paralysis. His head's down and folded under him. He can't get it up. This is a bill deformation in a cormorant. We see deformations in a variety of, of fish-eating birds, including American e bald eagles and cormorants. Um, speculation, and, and I don't know if it's really been definitively proven, but, but certainly evidence that uh, PCB toxicosis, polychlorinated biphenyls, which concentrate in fish, they're used a lot in the lumber paper mill industry and a number of different industries which discharge a lot of these PCBs out there into the water supply. The water, obviously, the fish concentrated. It's concentrated in the fatty tissues and then when they're ingested by fish-eating birds, there's a higher concentration and they, in the early neonatal uh, juvenile birds, they can get developmental anomalies like this crossed bill, deformed bill where it doesn't meet. The bill is always growing, it's just a keratinized surface kind of like your nail and so if you're not meeting correctly, it just keeps growing and growing and you get these 
these gross uh, scissor bill malformations, and obviously this bird is not going to be able to eat normally with that kind of a bill. This is a flock of uh, cedar waxwings. Cedar waxwings uh, feed in, in large flocks. They're a very gregarious bird in communities, and when they come upon a good feed source, it's almost a feeding frenzy type of activity. One bird's feeding and all his buddies start feeding. We see this uh, disease here, ethanol toxicosis, in, in these large winter feeding colonies of uh, waxwings. What happens is, is fruit-bearing trees, such as hawthorns, have these little over overwintering berries, people call them. They're actually palms. They're more in the apple family, but they're hanging there, and they get frozen thawed and frozen thawed, and they start to ferment, and they're a natural source of alcohols, most predominantly ethanol. The waxwings, uh, they start eating it and they get all excited because their buddies are eating and they pick down as many of these as they can. Very rapidly, these birds become drunk. They get high levels of ethanol in their system. There's no gross lesions of ethanol toxicosis, but what's the common thing when you drink and drive or drink and fly is you start crashing. And so uh, these birds will be found dead. They'll fly into things. They'll have uh, large hematomas in the subdural hematomas uh, over the brain, they'll have broken necks, they'll have hemorrhage around the heart. Those are the type of traumatic lesions that should indicate ethanol toxicosis. Uh, very common in wax wings, not so common in other birds because of their habits of the, what they eat and the way they eat. These are several wax wings that died of ethanol toxicosis. And here's some of these berries. The berries are fine initially, but like I say, they hang off the, the bush or the tree for a period of months and they go through a freeze-thaw cycle and they become very gelatinous and sticky and nicely fermented and then you can analyze these and get a high level of ethanol in them. Visceral gout. Gout is a, is a condition or a syndrome as opposed to a particular disease. We get gout in, in regards to dehydration or renal failure. All birds are susceptible. Remember, birds produce uric acid as their uh, type of nitrogenous waste as opposed to urine, and so this is a very crystalline, insoluble material. If they become dehydrated or renal failure for any reason, they get hyperuricemia, builds up in their bloodstream, and then it starts to precipitate out. Where does it precipitate? Preferentially, it'll go on the uh, outer surface of the heart, the pericardium. It'll get on the outer surface of the uh, liver can get it over the serosal surface of the gut, and then you get it in within the uh, parenchyma of the kidney itself. So these are the places. It's a white, <coughs> gritty, crystalline material, and it's always much more exciting grossly than it is histologically. As soon as you trim this in and think you're going to have a great histologic picture of gout, well, it, it is uh, soluble to a certain extent. It goes through the formalin, through the different ethanol grades, and by the time you get it, there's very little left histologically in there, so you're going to be disappointed. Here it is uh, covering the uh, surface of the liver, obscuring it with this white crystalline material. You get it in the air sacs as well. I think this is uh, the surface of an air sac that's frosted or crystallized. Some more in another lobe of the liver here. This is uh, over the uh, kidneys. The kidneys are kind of down in a, in a perirenal fossa, but, but you can see heavy, heavy gout crystals forming within the kidneys as well. This is amyloidosis. We see amyloid in, in a variety of birds, most commonly in waterfowl. And where do we see amyloid? Uh, mostly in the liver, sometimes also the spleen and the kidney, but the liver is the classic site in birds for heavy amyloid deposition. You can see this duck's liver, instead of being a nice uniform mahogany red-brown color, has this pale, waxy kind of cast to it. It's got kind of rounded uh, edges instead of nice sharp edges, and that's because of the expansion and the interstitium of the amyloid. Amyloid is, is seen secondary to a variety of, of systemic conditions, and it causes this enlargement, rounding, and pallor of, of the liver. Here's another liver taken out of another duck. Ducks particularly get this, and, and you can see the rounding and the pallor and the modeling here. These are the paired testes in a bird. Remember, the testes in a bird are not external in the scrotal sac, but, it, but up in the uh, body cavity, up <coughs> cranial to the kidneys, close to the midline. And here's a normal testy on one side, and here's a markedly enlarged testicle on the other side. 
And this is just to remind me to tell you that, that birds get uh, tumors like all other creatures do, and whatever tissue they have there is potential to get it. They particularly get in their testicles uh, seminomas and Sertoli cell tumors, and I believe this is a Sertoli cell tumor here. But uh, all birds get these, and they can either be discrete nodules or a generalized enlargement like we're getting here. On cut section, you can compare the, the normal with the very abnormal testicle and a more kind of a nodular part here, but a fairly generalized uh, neoplasm. And obviously histopath is indicated to, to come up with the correct diagnosis. The number one disease, uh, neoplastic disease in all bird species, domestic and wild, is lymphoma. The difference with lymphoma in the wild birds like this is that it's a, uh, not associated with either herpes virus like Merrick's disease or with retrovirus. It may well be there are retroviruses there, but we just simply haven't looked hard enough or, or, or understood enough about it to, to be able to diagnose it. But uh, we can get these pale, white, nodular infiltrates in virtually any organ and virtually any species. This happens to be liver from a raptor. I think it was a red-tailed hawk, and he's got multiple white, raised, firm nodules. Same bird in his kidney. He's got multiple pale nodules in his kidney. And this is that bird's ovary. And some of the smaller cystic looking structures are normal developing ova. But the very large, pale white, firm structures, those are multiple nodules of lymphoma. Uh, a, a more obscure tumor that I've seen a couple times now in birds. This happens to be a uh, vulture that was on exhibit at a zoo that died after many years in captivity. He was just sitting up on his perch and suddenly uh, flopped to the ground dead. They open this bird up, and most of the one ventricular wall has been replaced by this pale white multinodular mass. And on cut section, I think you can appreciate a little more. You know, we're in the, the left ventricle here, and almost the entire wall has been replaced by a large pale mass that's not very well demarcated. Well, this is a rhabdomyosarcoma, a striated muscle tumor. We see it in birds in their, their largest muscle masses, their most rapidly working muscles. So uh, most birds, you see it up in the uh, flight muscles of the arm and upper wing. However, we have seen uh, several cases in the uh, cardiac muscle as well, such as this case here. And that completes my presentation on wildlife diseases. I just want to reiterate the uh, different uh, pathologists and, and diagnosticians who have contributed slides to this talk. Uh, Drs. Fisher, Davidson, and Nettles with the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study in University of Georgia, Athens, Georgia. Dr. Steve Schmidt and Tom Cooley at the uh, Rose Lake uh, Wildlife Lab, part of the Michigan Department of Natural Resources in East Lansing, Michigan. Doctors Maddie Cupel, Willie Q Reed, and Mick Fulton, all with the Department of Pathobiology and Diagnostic Investigation, where I am at, at Michigan State University. Dr. Kevin Kazakis and Sandra Schroeniger at the Department of Veterinary Pathology at Purdue University. Dr. DeWald Keat with the Kruger National Park in South Africa. Dr. Elizabeth Williams with the Department of Veterinary Science at the University of Wyoming. And Dr. Mike Miller with the Colorado Division of Wildlife at Fort Collins, Colorado, have all generously provided uh, images for the.